Welcome to Boundless Pursuit, a weekly podcast providing motivation, entertainment, and education to anglers and outdoorsmen. I hope that the stories you'll find here will encourage you to chase your passion more fervently, to open your mind to new opportunities and perspectives. Your engagement and feedback is critical to the growth of this show, and I would love to hear your suggestions on topics or potential guests. You can reach me at boundlesspursuitfishing at gmail.com or at my website, www.boundless-pursuit.com. That's where you'll find all related articles, media, and merchandise. Please remember, the show will gain traction from your support. Be sure to like, comment, and share this podcast to your friends and connections. I'm your host, David Graham. Now let's get on to today's episode. You know, I love that this podcast has afforded me the opportunity to connect with a lot of really awesome anglers. But most of the guests that I've had so far are people that I've either known or been familiar with for a long time. And today's guest is a very interesting and diehard hunter, fisherman, and just outdoorsman with some really unique experiences in traveling here in the U.S. and abroad. His name is Chris Cook, and this is a guy who articulates and expresses a passion for the outdoors in a very pure and insightful way. From big game hunts in Africa, treks through the jungles of Thailand, to local fishing and hunting in his home state of Texas, Chris weaves a level of humility and minimalism into every experience he has. And during this conversation, we talk about growing up with nothing, enjoying the simple things, making sacrifices so that unique experiences are a reality, walk in the African bush with no shoes on and literally standing in the footprints of elephants and gaining the favor of locals wherever you go by staying humble and grounded and just getting out of your own way. We talk about catching the fierce African tiger fish, rare catfish species in Thailand, and enjoying a good homestyle meal in local diners of rural Texas. Chris Cook is definitely one of the most interesting guys that I've had the pleasure of talking to so far. And this is a guy that's got some very interesting and diverse experiences under his belt. And I think you're really going to enjoy this guy's perspectives and insights on hunting, fishing, and the outdoors in general. This is Chris Cook. All right, man. Well, now we're rolling. Now we're, now we're live. We, uh, we, we, we worked out any potential kinks, but, uh, Chris. It's awesome to get you on here. Um, I, like I was saying earlier, I somebody suggested you to me. So shout out to whoever you were. I feel bad I can't like name drop the person because uh, it's like it's one of those things I want to happen more with this podcast. I want people like suggesting. It's hard for me to like do my own recruiting because it's like sometimes the most interesting people are the ones that come from like left field. You know what I mean? They're like maybe people who I wouldn't have otherwise found but uh you know somebody had mentioned you to me i took one click i see the gnarly beard the long (laughs) hair it photos a tiger fish the crazy big game hunting i'm like oh okay you know i'm sold i I gotta know more but um but man I, i i saw that and uh and then i saw that you 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 do some writing on the website uh cafes and campfires I'm like, okay, you know, like here's a guy who does all these things and writes about it. Um, but I guess just, I don't know, dude, like if we're going to start anywhere, because your experience is like so all over the place with the hunting, with the fishing, with the travel, you know, you, you folks that are that nomadic are always so hard for me to know, like, wh- where's my landing spot with this guy? Like, where the hell do I start? But um, I guess let me know a little bit about the blog, because I thought you came at it from a unique angle where it's like half of it is describing different eateries half of it is describing just travel in general and then there's like a fishing and a hunting portion like what was the i don't know man like what was what was the motivation behind starting that in the first place the motivation was i got family scattered all over the world and i would you know you got kids growing up and all the grandparents want to know what are the kids doing and you know what did we do this weekend and i would text them or email them different things and then surely I would get a, a text from a grandma that goes, well, how come I didn't get the picture? But yeah, <laughs> well, whoever got the picture and I was like, all right, I'm going to solve this problem right now. I'm going to put all this in one spot and then I'll just send them the link. And, and if you don't see it, that's on you, right? That's how it started. It wasn't even, I guess a blog, but it was more or less just telling grandma, 
what we did this weekend. We went fishing here, you know, we, we ate at this cafe and it just started evolving. And then I, I, I haven't written on it as much as I should lately, but I, I, I kind of ended up with like these two groups of people. Like I would get a lot of comments about the food portion and I, I even had a lady goes, look, I don't hunt. I don't even like hunting, but I like your blog because I can come over here and go, well, if Chris has been to this cafe, then I know this is a good cafe. Yeah. Like, I don't read the hunting <laughs> part. I just go through trying to find if he was in Michigan and I'm in Michigan, I want to see what he ate. Then I have the, the guys that are like, I don't care about that. What'd you kill or what'd you catch? And it was all an accident. Honestly, it was just a, and I, I just write like I talk, I guess. I just, I'm, I don't know. I'm not, you know what I mean? I just start, I just start writing. Like if I was going to tell you a story, that's exactly how I write it. I don't try to be a, an author or, or go to some weird angle or have, you know, just, I just, just write what I, the way I talk. And it seems to work. People like it. It's probably because it's simple, right? It's not real hard to figure out. You you got a redneck who's 12th grade education writing. It's not hard to follow, is it? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I love people who actually write about what they're passionate about. And uh, and it's like in like an authentic way. I don't know, man. It's like, and I do a lot of it myself, but it's like, it's one of those things like, especially in this day and age, people want to be like entertained more than educated or they want like immediate entertainment right. no you're right. you're right if you don't entertain me in a flash of a second i'm gonna swipe i'm gonna swipe mm-hmm. you out of there or they only want to see some funny video um but like sitting and doing a real good read i i always like it especially i like that you mentioned you 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 write the way that you talk i like that because then i can like know what you're actually about i don't feel like you're trying to sell me a product um you know, it's it's like you're typing in conversational tone, uh, so it's 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 pretty funny. It's like I can right. like envision the person talking, but like I don't know. Like it just it threw me for a curveball when I was reading through your blogs, where it was like fishing, and then the cafe thing. So like, what is like the where does that come from? Like 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 writing about an it's like when I a lot of people who blog about like an eating experience. It's like some kind of like fine cuisine from an exotic location. And like a lot of yours is like diners and dives type of things. Like where did that come from? I always, I I tell people my grandparents are gone. I can't, I can't eat my grandma's cooking anymore. I want to eat someone's grandma's cooking. Look, it it just feels like growing up. It feels like home. I want hot coffee. I I want, I want to lay, look. I don't need my waitress to come up and be the nicest person. I need my, I want just bring me good food and let's be normal people. Okay. Yeah. That, that, and then in cafe, that's what you're going to find. You go to these chain places, they have a set way of these are our rules. This is what we do. Hey, I've been, I've, I was in a, in a cafe a couple of years ago. There's a buffet. There was a soccer team come in and they went the wrong way down the buffet. I just got in line with them because I'm not going to fight with these little kids. And the yeah. old lady waitress comes out and goes, Hey, what the hell are y'all doing? Y'all turn around and go the other way. That's, I love that lady the second she said that because that's yeah. grandma. <laughs> yeah. And I want to eat in grandma's house. Who doesn't yeah. love to eat at grandma's house? So if it's the most <laughs> off off the beaten path, backwoods, when I walk in, if someone, it's weird, but if someone's in the corner smoking a cigarette, the food's going to be good. Yeah. Oh, I, think I if, promise you that's just the way it is. <laughs> if, if somebody's, if like the hospitality feels like you're in somebody's home, like at least, you know, you can trust what's going on. Like, behind those metal doors like <laughs> you exactly. you can tr- you can trust like they're running a tight ship back there as far as like sanitary mm-hmm. condition putting some effort into the meals you know so i, I can for, for us hunting fishing that's an untapped resource there where do you think all these country boys go who who knows where the deer are at who knows where the fish are biting yeah <laughs> those local guys where are those local guys they're sitting around a the table they're all drinking coffee in the morning you come in there in the morning you buy a guy a cup of coffee and before you know it you start talking and all of a sudden well you know they they caught 25 channel cat down at the creek last week well guess where i'm going i wouldn't have known that otherwise right those people are friendly <laughs> they're local they they know what's going on in the area that i'm in you know i, I hunt in montana a lot i go up to montana i just stop at a cafe and i, I just start you know i gotta eat anyway and you start talking and you'd be surprised what guys if you call a guy up and he doesn't, he can't see you. People judge people. I don't care wh- whether you think you do or you don't. When you're talking to someone face to face, you're going to be a lot more apt to allow that person something you have than a guy yeah. on a phone. So if I, if I go over and buy a farmer a cup of coffee and say, hey, man, you know, I'm looking for mule deer and I got mule deer hunted. But you know what I do have is there's a bunch of geese laying in the corner of my field. You're more than welcome to. 
I yeah. just paid one dollar for a goose yeah. hunt. Right. <laughs> and you wouldn't have known that otherwise. And you wouldn't have got that at at the, the local fancy restaurant either, because those kind of people don't hang out there. They're in yeah. those those cafes. They're in that back corner drinking hot coffee. You know, that's the kind of guy. Well, that's the kind of guy I am, but that's the kind of people I want to be around too. Yeah. Well, that's like real authentic network and you can't get that behind a computer screen or on, on an Instagram message either. But I totally agree with you. It's funny you mentioned, like, I've read some of the ways that you describe these things and the experiences, and a lot of it seems like it, like, I know when I have come into these type of eateries or these kind of cafes, it's usually coming on the tail end of a really exhausting, like, day on the water. I smell like crap. I'm yep. sweaty. I got fish blood on me. And part of it is like, ooh. I don't know if I really want to walk into like this nice fancy place looking like this, but I know these folks ain't going to judge me and I'm going to get my food a little bit quicker and I'm just hungry. So I don't really care where I eat. And like, that's sort of like, it's funny how a lot of times discovering those like ma and pa style cafes is like what opens the door is like a hard day on the water or a hard day in a stand or a hard day outdoors there's something so inviting about going to that kind of place that like on the tail end of, I don't know, man, like a hard day, even working, doesn't even have to be outdoors, but it's like, you really like work up the appetite. And then part of you is like, ugh, ugh, you know, these folks aren't going to judge me as much. Like they're more honest. They're more willing. Like they've probably seen this before. And then it's like, that's how you discover those places that you like fall in love with Absolutely. going back every time. But then it's almost like when you go back the next time, and you're not sweaty and you haven't been working and it's just like you're fresh. It's like the experience isn't quite the same. I don't know if you would like notice that no. too. The the kind of people in those places and the people working in those places can relate to you smelling like bait because that's where yeah. they want to be. <laughs> right. That's what they, As soon as they get off, they're going to do the same thing you just did. And they were like, you know, hey, did you catch any fish? They might want a little information from you, but yeah. that's the kind of people. And your and your odor is like, right? <laughs> yeah. your odor is a conversation starter instead of a conversation right. ender. It's kind of funny how that works. Oh shit, get out of here! You know exactly what you smell like at the end of a gator guard trip. That's a different <laughs> smell. The only other smell close is musky. If you catch uh, a big musky and you walk around to. with a big musky, they smell just like a gator guard. Well, I hope I find that one out soon. I'm like I want to squeeze that trip in a lot of people who know me and know like my fishing endeavors like muskies like it, it's one that's eluded me i've tried for him a few times i just haven't been able to seal the deal i was like i may try to squeeze that one in this year but i can't speak to the muskie but i, I can definitely speak to the alligator guard thing it's like you smell and you got the unavoidable like mud on you like yeah, it, yeah you're not Probably going mud. after them <laughs> yeah you're going to get mud and blood and carp juice and guard juice on you. It's like, shit, I can't just go eat it. Any old, you know, I, I got to go somewhere where I won't be. I Me, mean, I'm like self-conscious. Like, I'm like, oh, I better go somewhere where they ain't going to judge me. But it's, it's just, I don't know. I read that. I was like, that's a unique spin on things. I like that. But it's also like, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm very much, I think I probably speak your same language here where it's like, when you're out there, like you, there's like a culture of, honest hard-working people that run those kind of places and like you feel like indebted to like support them i get the same way like i get the same way with like old school tackle sh like tackle shops they're dying yeah. off they're going away like like here where i live in southwest florida like bass pro shops is here you drop that in it's like a nuclear bomb goes off and kills the tackle store so it's like you i don't know man it's like i, I get this like warm spot in my heart when i'm like driving to the beach or i'm driving to the water if I see like an old, one of them real old, like salt of the earth, stanky tackle shops where everything's overpriced and the guy behind the counter's pissed off, like I always want to go in there and give those guys my money. Like, <laughs> absolutely. But they're the same way. People, you know? They get they get so much intel though. If you can get in good with those guys, if you give them your business a few times, they'll start dropping the knowledge on you quick. But. Uh, it's kind of the same way, but man, I was reading your, um, I, I was reading through your blog too and your page and, and some of the other stuff that I know about you. And it, and it sounds like your background in the outdoors is, is it's clear that it's like sort of running the family for generations. Yeah. If, if I'm not Generation. mistaken, 
Um, and you know, some people have that and some people don't, but I'm just kind of curious, like your upbringing, I don't know, man, like in the outdoors, like, like at what point did you start getting pushed, you know, not to, not to go like, tell me your whole life story, but I, I'm always interested in like, sort of, you know, cause not everybody wants to do it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like some people you try to get them in the outdoors and it just doesn't work for them. But, uh, you know, how did, how did you, I don't know anything different. And I, I mean, I, people look at me like, what do you mean? When I was growing up, we never, you didn't, we, we, they, the adults were skinning deer. The adults were cleaning fish. The adults are, you know, cleaning the, the ducks or whatever it was. Never once did, did my grandpa or uncle dad or anyone set me down and say, this is how you skin a deer. It was just that we was, we were born into it. It was around us our entire life. You just, you kind of learned it like, through osmosis like you were it just it was just went into you like we we never were taught cooking and cleaning and all it, it, because it was everyday life it was what they did it was what my grandparents did there i mean generations and generations so my great third great i think grandpa was actually fought in the in, in for the republic of texas so I got the little certificate that says I'm a son of the republic of texas so we've been here before texas was here so oh, wow. that's all we ever did. They lived, they lived that way. And and we're poor growing up. So we lived that way. We didn't know we were poor. As I started, yeah. it's kind of <laughs> ironic. You get a few dollars and realize that you were poor before, right? Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't trade a minute of it. Don't get me wrong. I grew up in a, in a trailer with six people. I mean, literally a trailer. Like our, our house could get a flat trailer. But at the time, I was like, "This is the worst. This is horrible." Because I don't have everything you know other kids have. That was the be- that that was the best thing that could have happened to me. Because now, when I do have something, I can look back and appreciate way more what I do have because I know where I come from. And I tell people all the time, "Your problem is you've never had nothing." And they look at me cross-eyed, and I'm like, "Look, if you at some point in your life, if you'd have been in the dirt, face down, like this is it, I can either lay right here and die." Or I can roll over, look at the sun, and freaking get up and do something about it. That's going to change everything from that point forward. I'll promise you. And, and not that it's right or wrong. People don't have a choice sometimes in the way they grew up. I'm, I was very lucky. Not no, I didn't know that till I was an adult. That the way I grew up was made me the way I am now. So I appreciate everything way more. Look, I know I get to do a lot of stuff, but I work. I work a forty-hour week just like everybody else. Yeah, I live way under my means to get to go do what I do because I'm not scared to go back to nothing. I already survived nothing once. Throw me back down there again. I'll come crawling out another time. I've yeah. already been there. Yeah. So for me, <laughs> driving a 20 year old vehicle. So what? It starts and runs. I flip the light switch and the power come on. Now let's go fish. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't, if you're impressed with my truck, fine. if you ain't fine, I don't care. I'm not doing this for you. I'm not doing this for the world. So I've already been down there, dude. I ain't scared to go back again. So if I spend my last dollar to go to on a plane ticket to wherever, that's a decision I made. But I also understand the consequences because I've been there. Yeah. That's kind of the way my, my mentality is for everything I do. Just Now, like, what, what, uh, what, like, region of Texas are you growing up in? Because it's like you made such a enormous leap. Well, I don't know. It's like you've done some crazy stuff. So it's like I always, like, I got to figure out how you got there, but it's like, what part of Texas are you in? And, you know, you say you, you were brought up in fishing and hunting, but it's like, well, like what kind of fishing, like what kind of hunting, like, what was the, I mean, it's it all the local things. Like we, once a year, my grandparents would take us to Colorado to, to trout fish. But at the end of the summer, when we went, we would have picked up beer cans on the side of the highway for three months of our summer. And the last week of our summer before school, we would take a trip to Colorado. But if we didn't pick up enough cans for gas money, then we didn't get to go to Colorado. So <laughs> that to us was that was a huge vacation. Because like I said, I grew up in a trailer park, it's north central Texas, Young County. So you go to West Texas, west from there, you're it's pretty remote. You know, you're just very, very small towns. Part of kind of the wild crazy stuff we grew up pretty feral like it was a trailer like you're not sitting around in the house all day in a trailer with six people and half the time we didn't even have electricity so we're outside so we're chasing we're catching we're whatever you can find to do outside 
And I had two brothers, so that helps. You always have that friend. You might fight him, but he's your friend, right? Yeah, you go yeah. down to the crawdad <laughs> hole, you get some bacon and a string or whatever it is. It was <laughs> that was entertainment because it was it was kind of by default. Like we didn't have many toys, we didn't have many things, many. So you had to figure out what you were gonna do in in nature. Like, and it's all there if you figure it out. And I figured it all out, not knowing at the time how much skill and life lessons that you're learning until you get older. And you, and you, 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 like my mate, I hunt with a guy that lives in Dallas now. Great dude, but he's just not a real experienced guy. But I'll say yeah. something and he'll look at me and go, How do you even know that? And I'm like, Well, when I was 12, you know, we were in a pasture, we did such and such. And he's like, like No one could know that without having grown up that way. Like, there's just things. And like, like I said, at the time, I didn't realize that. At the time, I was like, We're broke. We're the poorest family in town. Our house had a flat. My shoes don't match. You know, that kind of stuff. It was horrible. Yeah. But now I'm like, that's exactly what I needed to be what I am right now. Now, whether mm-hmm. you like what I am right now, doesn't matter. I do. And that, and I know that that's what taught me to be this. So yeah, it was awful. No, that's, I love that. And so it's like, I think about people who've like hunted and fished, you know, I was, I, you could say your whole life. Um, and I made like this funny clip even recently, like that I, that I posted where I was like in it, I think it ruffled some feathers where I was talking about, you know, I don't like when people say that they've been fishing since they were two years old. Like you can't, you can't fish right. when you're two years old. Well, I understand though. It's like people are brought up in that, like it's around them. It's part of like the culture of their family. It's part of just what, like what they live in. And I was the same way. I mean, my my I mean, we fished when we were tiny little kids with my dad and with my granddad. But it wasn't until later that it like clicked as something that I like was like actively engaged in, and like I loved it. Like I was like, this was for me. It wasn't something I was doing. It was like it wasn't something I was you know I was just there for. It was something like this is what I want to like commit. This is like my thing. At what point did like? You know, again, I know you grew up because that's just what you did. You said, yeah, that's just what we did. But at what point did you say, well, this is like, you know, this is this is for me because your passion grew into these wild trips, like, you know, to exotic places. And I'm just wondering how it evolved into that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, how did some of those things even get on the radar or something you'd want to do? Because a lot of people... I mean, a lot of people plateau and they 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 get to whitetail deer, they get to turkey hunting, they get to duck hunting, they get to bass fishing and catfishing, and this is you know, that's it. Like that, you know, that it, it plateaus and it just stays put. But like yours, it's not. I don't. I don't want. It sounds bad to say. I don't want to say it's not normal, but it's like it's a different caliber. Like the passion is blatant. You're writing about it. You're you're photographing it. You're you know, I mean, you're doing these crazy things most people would not do. So I'm like wondering how it, when did that start to really like take over? When I started not being able to do it because adult life comes into play. When you're a little kid and you have that 12 hours of daylight and you're free to roam, you you, you don't realize how much you're loving and how and, and everything you're doing. And when you start getting that about 16, 15, 16, 17, now you got to work a little bit for your gas money. Well, your buddy calls and says, hey, sand bass are running at the river and I've got to go, you know, work for four hours. That's when you, when you start missing it. That, that's when I realized, like, that's not just something I do. That's part of me. Like, yeah. I felt like I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. I felt like fish are there. I'm supposed to be there. Right. Like as a little kid, that's your that's your mentality. But when it, when it starts getting taken away, I think is when the passion really like really had to realize, like, wait a minute, this is. Life isn't isn't just fishing and chasing frogs. I, I always thought it was and hoped it was. But now that I have to have, I got responsibilities. It made what I did more meaningful. And then I think that's when it really like clicked. Like, hey, not everyone gets to do this, and you're not going to get to do this forever. When you start yeah. realizing those things, that's when I really started. Like a, a, every opportunity I get, I'm taking. I tell I, there was a, one of our friends graduated, you know, earlier, and I said. You, just do it. Just go do it. What? Anything you want, because you're always going to wonder the result. At least if you fail, you fail. It's mm-hmm. over. But you're always, always going to wonder what the result would be of everything if you don't go do it. Don't be afraid to fail. I, I'm more afraid to not go do something. I'm more afraid that I'm going to pass something up. Yeah. You know, whatever crazy 
thing it is. Like, well, we jump in a little little hunt. The 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 Cape Buffalo with an air gun. That's stupid, but it can be done. And I said, all right, I'm going to do it. Right? Like I because had I not said had I not agreed to that. Three years from now, I'd be going, man, I wonder if I could have actually done that. And I, that's the last thing I want to do is wonder. Yeah. I want to know the result. Failure's fine, dude. I fail all the time. We all do. Yeah. No. You, to me, this is the way I think of it. Humans are the only being born on this planet with the knowledge of their own death. Nothing mm-hmm. else realizes it's going to die when it's born except you. And right. everyone knows that. Why are you not taking full advantage of everything? Because you have the knowledge to know what's going to happen in the end. Nothing else does. Sure, they don't want to die, but they don't understand the concept. The deer's not born going, well, I got three years and I'm dead. That's not the way the the, the nature works. We have that. We get that. We were given that. Hey, you got about 65 to 85, depending on how you live. Everyone knows that. And everyone still just walks around like zombies wasting time. And it can yes. never be taken. I think I wrote an article about this, in fact, about time. You, you, you can't buy more of it. And you, you don't know when it's going to end. Like I, I, having that knowledge to me should be on the forefront of every of every decision. Mm-hmm. In my mind, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I've done dangerous crap. I could die. Well, guess what? I'm going to die at the end anyway. So <laughs> let's go for it. I'm not wondering what's going to happen, right? Yep. Well, I'm not it, stupid. I don't go do reckless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some people do, and they, they, for whatever reason, they need that. I, I get. I don't know, man. It's I geek out over like what makes people tick. I don't know why. It's just something that kind of fascinates me. But it's like I am like convinced that some people are like born into certain interests. People are like, oh no, you you learn it over time, or and there's some of that is true. But I'm convinced that like people have inherent interests that is like I, I don't know if it like goes back to <laughs> origins of mankind. But you think about when you look, like, you could walk into I like to use this analogy. You could walk into a daycare right now that's got 20 kids. There'll be one kid in the corner with blocks and he's just engaged in the process of building. There'll be one kid that's just running fast, just seeing how fast he can run. There'll be one kid that's you know, I don't know, gathering the others and using some, you know, inherent ability to influence others, whether it's influencing them to do bad things or gathering them up to say, hey, let's go play this game. You know, there's it's like there's there's certain characteristics that it seems like kids are born into having. And I know like in within my family structure, I've got one relative who and this is my understanding is he's very like bizarrely in tune with mechanics and engineering and building and like to to like a leaps and bounds beyond the normal person it's just things click when it comes to mechanisms taking something apart putting it back together and i was told that when he was a child you know none of his brothers are this way it's my my mom's brother his parents weren't that way it was just him like when the other kids were outside playing sports or the other kids were outside doing this he was always inside taking electronics apart unscrewing them putting them back together and this is like well nobody taught him that but it's like i think certain humans were like programmed for certain things and i feel like for the outdoorsmen i don't know man it's like there's this calling that certain men have you know some women too but it's like some men are called to like combat some men are called to building and like providing in other ways. And some men are like really, really called to the outdoors for whatever reason. It's like this, it's this weird thing where like you can have everything like me. And I always tell my wife this, I'm like if we won the lottery tomorrow and I want $10 trillion, people are like, oh yeah, right. You're just saying, I don't know. I know how I am. If I had all the resources monetarily to do whatever I wanted, I would go to parts of the earth where I have nothing because I feel like in my spirit, I need to like, I need to like, you know, skim that lifestyle. It's like, I need to dip into, I don't know, man. It's like that ar- ar- archaic or ancient way of living, not necessarily to do it forever, but it's like, I need to taste that. I need to smell that. I need to know what it's like to live with nothing it's a really weird thing. I don't mean on the streets. I mean like in a jungle somewhere, in right. a hut somewhere. Like I want to see people that have nothing. It's it's this strange anomaly. I'm like, why do I feel that way? Why do like 
if I had all the resources to buy all the biggest stuff, would I use that money to go to places that don't have any of that? And it says, but anyway, and it's so it, it, that's why I've been very interested in what you do and reading your blog. I feel like there's some parallel interests there, but you've lived it like you've done it. At what point did you decide to start? I don't know, man, like leaving and, and going to these places where I don't know, man, it's like you don't know what you're getting into. What was your first international trip anyway? Probably the uh, I guess the, like a major like I, I needed to plan a little more for it was uh, Thailand, mm. and I know there's a lot of opinions about the way they fish, all these different things. But hey, I never been to Thailand, and and it's cheap. So, and then we do this a lot. I say we. My wife goes with me most of the time. She fishes. She's fished in about twelve or thirteen countries. She she fishes a lot. But and rather than having like this destination like we have to go to this country for this thing i more match my the, my money to my trip i yeah. go backwards <laughs> so look there's there's what like thirty five thousand some odd species of mammals on the planet no mm. fish on the planet five thousand species of mammals on the planet i can't catch and kill all of this so i'm not going to sit at home wasting time not that i don't have this dream animal or dream fish but why take three years for the one animal when there's there's so much more to enjoy on a trip? If you're going to a trip for just this animal or just this fish, you're going for all the wrong reasons. It's that's one percent of your trip. That's a tiny little like if I pull the trigger on the gun, you know how long that takes? That's that's a tiny fraction of why we're there. So that's yeah. not the goal to me. My my goal is I want to see everything I can everywhere. And if I have just for an instance, if I have five thousand dollars. Then I start looking for something that interests me that costs five thousand dollars. Where's a country I can go to get the most out of that country and do something I've never done? I'm I'm, I'm not looking at it as oh, I don't want to go there. I look at it as what what is available for this amount of money. Now there's yeah. like next year we're going uh, we're we're going to Zambia. All right, that's a trip that I have to plan for, and that's on that's a scheduled thing, and we'll save for it, and that's where we'll go. But there's times. I just start looking at flights. Where's the cheapest flights to right now? Actually, not far from you. You might see me for too long. I, I can get to, I can get to, uh, I think there's a flight to West Palm for $125. Oh, yeah. Like, go there, right? Like, I've been there. It's, it's awesome. But I'm not going to sit here saying, man, if I just had $500, I could fly to Montana. Well, just take my $150 and take me to Florida and let's go fishing. You're yeah. not going to regret it. You are not going to regret it. I'll promise you. Yes, there are destinations I would I'd rather go to, but I'm not going to sit around wasting time to to try to get to that. Look, if you have your dream, everyone should save for that. I'm talking about the you know a once a year trip, something like that's different. I'm talking about like we do a lot of weekend stuff. I'll go to Cabo for three days. It's right here. Yeah, I can be, I can be in Cabo in two hours. It's cheap. We go down there, catch you a rooster fish. You had a good weekend. It's a little more expensive than a than a weekend at home. But hotel, food, and gas, you're going to have to have that regardless of where you go. You have to eat anywhere on the planet. So figuring food into the cost of me is like, eh, it's not like you're sitting at home and not eating. Like right. That's part of living. That's not part of your vacation. So that, the, that's the way we did it. That's the, that's the way, like, Thailand was a, hey, that's affordable. Like, there's some wild fishing. We did a lot of wild fishing. But, you know, there's the lakes. There's these 20 acres. Or like there's there's little ponds whatever that doesn't matter the point is i'll go catch a fish may not be the the way i wanted it at the time but i also seen a guy riding a bicycle up to the lake catch a cobra and stick it in a basket and drive off would <laughs> yeah. i've seen that sitting at home saving money to go no but that's yeah. my point like, there's a million things going on right it's not just that the, the fishing and the hunting that's what i love that's what takes me to most places but if you don't enjoy everything around it, you're you're missing. You're not getting your money worth. Yeah, you're, you're I think it's. Uh, I think a lot of that too. I, and I I can't speak from experience because, like I told you, I've not yet been out of the country. But I have this like deep desire to like, go to places that are just different than where I'm at because I like I have this need internally to reset all the time. You know, because like when you're like like me, I'm I'm so like called to be outdoors to be somewhere wild it's like weird it's like i have this desire to like it's almost like 
this need to simulate <laughs> like hunting and gathering but without the actual threat of what can happen if you're if like your life depends on that but it's like you, you got to get close to it so i work right now in like basically in a factory setting as as a manager of people in you know in a, like an industrial setting it's boxes it's conveyors it's structured it's like daily schedules everything's uniform so you know it's it's easier for somebody like me and my character type to you know it, it weighs on me a lot now you know I, I like what i do i love the people i work with and i like the, the financial benefit that i get out of that and how it benefits my family but it's also like it if i don't get thrust out of there it can it like it can mess me up it really well, it can will mess you up. and i think it, that's in every person i don't care Mm -hmm. it's it's in your dna there's hundreds of thousands of years of history that says so we just recently by recently in, in time 100 years is not long just decided let's just all stay inside and build things that's not the way we're that we were made it's right. in there somewhere and even the mo my neighbor across the road that doesn't even mow his own yard that's fine that's his deal it's in him somewhere but yeah. but it hasn't been brought out because he hasn't been in a situation to where it could be. It, it, I, I really do feel like and all kinds of people. I mean, like I said, I've been all around, all different kinds of people. It, it can, something can trigger this. Yeah. Whether it could be as simple as a bobber going under, but a guy sitting on a dock and a bobber goes under and he's like, whoa, man, I love fishing now. You know, it, it may take a, a, a life altering thing, but I, I truly feel like it's in everyone's DNA in there somewhere. Yeah. To, to, to do this, it, People well, just suppress it or their lifestyle doesn't allow it to come out. I don't oh, think a lot sure. of people consciously say, oh, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, that's not in me. It is. Yeah. Generations, thousands of generations will will tell you that it's in you, whether you like it or not. Oh, a thousand it's percent. Well, it's like in like what I alluded to earlier, like coming like like if I come home from work and I get frustrated about things, I'll a lot of times sit back and I'll like kind of like tally up like what really happened? Like how hard was my day? And then I'm like, man, I've got it so good. Like we have it so good in America. So then it's like, I know that part of my like need to get outdoors or to have less or to, like I said, simulate like the ability to gather and provide for a family. Like to me, it's like almost like fishing a little bit speaks to that. But some of it, too, is like going to this place that have nothing. It's like I, I want something that's going to give me a good like perception of what the world is really like. But then I also wonder and I wonder like your opinion on this. This is like one of my main questions I had for you, because it's like something I've noticed is Americans, it seems like just aren't doing these trips. You look at like international fishing specifically. It's it is a scene dominated by like Europeans and other people you just don't see americans leaving america and i'm like what well, like i'm interested in your input on that like why do you think people aren't wanting to to i think people say they want to but i mean you just don't i feel like you just don't see it and i i guess i exist more in the fishing uh -huh. world cuz europe is tiny compared to america but they have taken over the international fishing scene it's very weird to me and i'm like what why well, they absolutely have it fishing well part to me i fished with you know who corda is right big carp tackle company they got the uh -huh. uh, what is it called monster carp show i fished yep. with those guys when they filmed monster carp here so fish went down there a couple of days fish talked to them and all that these guys Europeans, especially, in my opinion, and and Asians that, that I've fished with, they're hunters that don't have a way to hunt. They turn mm -hmm. fishing. It's not. I'm not saying that they they wouldn't love fishing anyway. What I'm saying is a lot of these guys' approach to fishing is the same kind of mentality and approach that I have to hunt, or most hunters I know. But they don't have that option, especially in Asia. When I see like a guy fish with there, he, he's he's big snakehead guy. You know, that's hunting. You're hunting yeah. those snakeheads. When those snakeheads are on fry, that's hunting. And I can see it. He, he clicks. And, and it's not, he, he doesn't get to express that. It, and like I said, it's in there. I feel like it's in you. I feel like it's in everyone. And then the way that he gets that, that predator uh, of instinct out is through fishing because he, he doesn't have an option yeah. to go chase an animal. 
And I feel like there's some hunting in Europe depending on the country, but a lot of those guys are the same way. I see the way some of them operate, and I'm like, dude, that's a hunter with a fishing pole. That's, uh, that's a interesting. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, you're right about the Americans, though. There's most are, it's a lot. Of, I, if I see Americans somewhere else, it's usually a tourist spot, and then I try to get out of there as fast as possible. But right in the middle of the jungle in Asia, no. There's no, you're not going to find an American. There's this weird fear of like different places and different ideas in this country. That's very strange. It may, maybe it, it, you know what? It may exist in other places, but I just, it seems so intense here. Like if I talk to somebody that's like not a fisherman, just like the average person on the street about, um, you know, all, or like, Hey, I, like this is an example. This, this is a simple example, but it's like when, when I moved from Arkansas, this is a place that I've lived all over the freaking country arkansas most recently before florida when i told the people in arkansas i'm moving to florida their first response every time aren't you worried about hurricanes yep. or whenever i was first moving to oklahoma aren't you worried about tornadoes or when i'm first moving to south texas i was working in the oil fields aren't you worried about you know rattlesnakes ms-13 everybody has these fears of like different places and going somewhere new. I'm like, what caused that? Is it the media? Like it, everything, this just everything's just fear coming in. There seems it's like these comfort. There, well, yeah, it's definitely that. For but, Americans, I'm telling you now, it's it's comfort. There's where we. I'm gonna say we, even though I'm not that way. I'm American, so I'm gonna say we. We are yeah. so scared to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like it, it makes no sense. It, we were in Thailand at a temple, right, doing tourist things. There's tourist people there. There's an American lady there. And she's she's complaining that it's hot. I'm like, lady, do you not have Google? Like, you came to a tropical country. Like, you're <laughs> in a freaking rainforest. It's hot. What did you think was going to happen? But we're so afraid to be uncomfortable. Like, aren't you scared of hurricanes? People in Florida, aren't you scared of, you know, whatever it is, a tornado or a whatever? everywhere is as dangerous as you make it. I've been yeah. more scared. Johannesburg, South Africa is not, there's a lot of unsafe places. I've just, I've been in just as much danger in Detroit, Michigan at a baseball game. You can make anywhere as safe or as, as dangerous as you want it to be. I walked down the streets of Bangkok at 3 a.m. and not a care in the world. I wouldn't do that here where I live right now. It, yeah. it's, it's your it's your perception of because you're comfortable here you don't feel like it's as dangerous if you're outside of here looking in you're like oh man look there, they, they, there's another drive by you know two blocks away aren't you worried oh no it happens all the time well hurricanes happen all the time in florida that's why you don't care right yeah. <laughs> everywhere in the world has their thing it's new yes. to you it's a new danger that you're not comfortable with you're not familiar with and that's what i think it holds people up because they, they don't want to be uncomfortable. Like I said earlier, if you've never had nothing, right? Like that's, that's a lot of people's problem. We can't, I can't do without Starbucks. I can't do without this. I can't do without that. Mm -hmm. it, then, then you can't go. If you physically or mentally can't get past that little hurdle, then no, you're going to have to stay here. Sorry. Like in Zambia, they didn't, they didn't have electricity. You know how hard it is? Look, I do it all the time, but I'm saying, you know how hard it is when it's 105 degrees to lay in a grass hut underneath a mosquito net with no electricity? And you know when the sun goes down, that's it. Like, we have no other option here. Like, right. you're not going to get to pick up your phone. It didn't charge all day. You're not going to get to turn on the radio. You're not. You are. What you're doing now is what you get because it's about to be blacker than you've ever seen outside. I'll promise you that. <laughs> and the closest light is hours away. And people are scared of that because they never experienced that. And they, 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 a lot of these tourist places, people go to, oh, I've been to Thailand. No, you, you, you went to Thailand, but you went, go to Thailand. You were inside the borders, but you didn't see the country. You seen the country that they want to show you because they know you're weak and you can't get up into that jump. That's what they yeah. do. They cater to you because you bring money here, but you didn't see Thailand. You seen a touristy spot with about you know, a quarter of them was white people. Yes, there's some locals, but they're catering to you. That sign on the wall is in English for a reason, right? Like when the rules are in English because he's your dumb ass that breaks them all the time. Yeah. Not theirs. They don't put <laughs> right. these things in their language because they know how to act. It's you. They understand that you're going to act like an idiot because you're American. Look, dude, we're big, we're loud. Like we might not realize it, but when you go to another place and you see American across, I'm like, Man, is that what I sound like? Is that what I look like? 
we're big, we're loud, we like to, well, I'm doing it now. You throw your hand. Most of the world is not that way. Especially in Asia, they're they're quiet. They're they're well, they're smaller people. They just they have their ways. They don't bother nobody. It's it's uh, it was awesome. But Americans don't want to go there and be uncomfortable and not be able to get whatever it is they have to have that they've convinced themselves they have to have. I'll promise you, you'll live without a Starbucks. I don't know if half of America realizes that, but you can't survive without it. Yeah, but you need. I tell my brother, my brother this all the time. You need to go somewhere where you don't have any of that to realize what you do have. Just look. Yes. You need to go to Zambia and sleep in a grass hut under a mosquito net and hope you don't get malaria to realize that this, this, this mosquito net, this whole situation is because it's, it's due to something we don't even have to deal with every day. We don't have malaria. We don't have to worry about it. Mosquito bites you, you slap it, you go on. Yeah. <laughs> you get bit by a mosquito in Zambia, that might be it for you. So we have to take precautions to do that. People, they don't even realize those kind of things exist. It's just not like they can't even come. And honestly, there's a lot of them. Yes, that could do it. But it's just not safe for a lot of people. They, 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 they wouldn't be able to survive. You know, someone like I'm going to go back to Zambia again because it's very, very remote. That was a tough, tough place to fish. But I work with people today that I'll promise you wouldn't have made a week there. They, yeah. they physically would not have made it. And they don't need to go there because I, you, you don't need to go over there and hinder these people that are already struggling to survive. They're doing everything they can just to get the little bit of income you're bringing them. You're right. And take, to get a little bit of money off of a fishing trip. The last thing they need to worry about is you having a heat stroke because you don't go outside. You know, you don't need to be there. That's a really, I'm not really saying don't good go point. On vacation. I'm saying yeah, you need that... to match your capabilities and your physical to where you're going because you're going to be miserable if you're not. That's Some a people really... can't take cold. Hey, you know, ice fishing is not for you then. That's fine. Yeah. I, I'm just saying, know what you are. Understand where you're going. Freaking Google the weather, would you, lady? I mean, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. It's hot in Thailand. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It is. And we all know that. What are you doing here? Right? Like, all... If you can't take it, why are you here? It's also disappointing because you know that, the, you know, if you're only seeing one American every so often, every American you do see is like a representative of what the rest of that place must exactly. be like. So, like, you don't want somebody to show up and be weak and sloppy or rude or just like, uh, I don't know, man. It's like, that's disappointing. But um, I want to dive into the Africa thing because I think, like, as far as, like, your stuff, it's like a lot of your Africa experiences are what really like see like were the most impactful for what I saw. I was like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is crazy. Like, you know, it was like, it was like my landing spot. I think even your profile picture might be, maybe it's a tiger fish. It's I've looked at the tiger fish, you know, to the point of exhaustion. But uh, at some point, again, you know, you make a decision, say, I want to go here. Like what, what, what opportunity opened for you to even get to go do such a sure. trip? Because I think of some of that, I'm like the planning involved, like you got to have, like, is there people there that are going to speak English? Is like, what is like, what, you know, this is, you're going to love this story. We yeah. weren't supposed to be in Zambia. <laughs> oh, I didn't okay. research Zambia. I didn't, I, I knew where Zambia was. Obviously I've hunted in, in no far North South Africa on the border there, you know, in that area, but we were supposed to be in Mozambique. Hmm. Tiger fishing, but in a different part of the Zambezi, down the, the lower part. And the reason for that was is because, and I try to do this anytime we fish or hunt. If if I'm going to pay fifteen hundred dollars for a plane ticket, then when I get over there, I'm going to do everything I can on my plane ticket. So mm -hmm. we hunted for a week, and I'm like, look, it's only you know a couple hundred more dollars to just go to Mozambique and catch tiger fish too. Yes, it makes for a longer vacation, but it didn't make sense in my brain to fly back home and then turn around and fly back if you wanted to fish later. So we, we, we've got to where we kind of started doing a lot of fishing, hunting, combo trip kind of deals, you know, because yeah. look, if you're hunting an animal, there has to be water there. Animals have to have water. Well, if you have water, you have fish, right? So let's yeah. go catch them. And most hunters, professional hunters or guides, they fish for fun. They don't hunt for fun. Hunting is their job. Yeah. So you, you, you talk to like, you ask the pH, like, Hey man, is there anywhere we can fish? Man, their eyes will light up. And, uh, there's, they just, they're like, you want to fish? You, you came all the way over here to fish. Yeah. No, I came over here to hunt, but I know that, that there's fish here. I love fishing too. And it, 
you can get that guy involved in something he likes, the trip is so much better. Yeah. You know how many Americans he's got into a zebra? He's so tired of your accent and looking at zebras. He's like, you know, it's his job. <laughs> but if you say, hey, man, is there any barbell in that creek over there? And he's like, what? I'm like, let's go. Let's go get some bait, you know. And, and all of a sudden, you know, now the trip's changed. Well, this particular guy was that I was hunting with, he was in Mozambique the week before hunting crocodiles. So I'm like, hey, can we get back over there while we're here? He's like, absolutely. So, you know, we're going to leave from Johannesburg and it's a, I don't know what it was, three or four hour flight to wherever we were going to in Mozambique. And we get a call the night before from our contact in Mozambique. And he says, uh, hey, there's no COVID test here. So you can't leave. I'm like, what do you mean I can't leave? And he goes, you have to have a COVID test to leave the country. And and you will allow you into the country because you'll be negative, right? Mm -hmm. But to leave the country, you have to have a test again. And we don't have any in this country. So you may be here for a week. You may be here for a month. They're all oh, gone. Geez. So I'm like, as much as I'd love to say, F it, let's go and hope we're there for a month. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I do have a little responsibility, right? So I'm like, I look at my guy, I'm like, I'm not flying out for a week. Like, what am I supposed to? Cause he has, a, he has hunters coming in. He had a whole family coming in. He didn't even have room for everybody. Right. So I'm basically just stuck in South Africa with a week. I could go try to change my flight, I guess, but not really what I wanted to do. And I said, Hey, let's just start calling. Like, you know, people, I know people. So we get on the phones and we start looking, we find this guy in, in Zambia. He goes, I know this guy. He's uh he uses the same booking agent. I do. You should be good. Do you have a problem going to Zambia? I said, I don't have a problem. It's just that I always try to research where I'm going. I try to, you know, I try to know a little bit about the area so that you, it's hard to even have a conversation with a guide when you don't even know what half of the animals and the trees are, right? Like, yeah. You know, I'm like this past two weeks ago, whenever we were in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, and I and I said to, you know, to the pH, I'm like, hey man, is that whatever the tree was? I don't remember. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, how'd you know that? And I'm like, because I want to know what I'm looking at. I want to know everything around me. And he's like, that's impressive. Because most guys just show up and, you know, point me at the animal. Like, that's their deal. I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> dude, I want, I want to be in this environment, you know? So reluctantly, but only because I didn't know what I was getting into, we go to Zambia. I don't know these people. I don't know the lodge. I don't know nothing. There's a huge chance, but hey, I ain't got nothing to do for a week. So I fly into Livingstone, Zambia, and there's a dude there in a van, and he had a had the shirt with the logo that I recognized. And I'm like, hey man, you taking American fishing this week? He said, Yeah, get in. Four hour drive in a truck, just down these just two track. I mean, keep your mouth closed because you'll chip your tooth. I mean, these yeah. these <laughs> holes are it's bad. <laughs> and we get back there, and I was under the impression we were starting fishing the next day. We get there, and this guy's like, You ready? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, let him take your bag, get in the boat. And I'm like, oh, I love this dude already. Like we, we ain't messing yeah. around. So we go get in the boat and we take off fishing and there's a little language barrier that he, he spoke English. This guy did great guy. Look, he knows the river. This is what, what I've learned running around. Like fishermen don't have to talk to each other. It's nice to be able to communicate, but we both know the goal. Fishing's fishing's fishing all over the world. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I have some some fishing ability, obviously, but I don't know tiger fish, but I know fishing in general. I know we're fishing for a predator. I know what to look for in the river. You know, they're not going to be in the in the one foot deep rapids. Right. Like, I understand that he he's a fisherman. He knows like you don't have to communicate a whole lot when you you both know what you're doing. And man, I was not prepared for what we were doing, which we get out into the Zambezi and there's no trolling motors on these boats. His boat was the nicest boat, but it's literally just a fiberglass hull. Like it was, and, and it's fine. But yeah. when you see the other option, that fiberglass hull will look like, you know, a $60,000 Ranger boat compared to what these other guys were fishing in. But it's free line in these giant live baits, 10 inch long bulldog fish with just straight onto a hook yeah. and just flipping them into these pools. Well, the bulldog fish goes this way. The boat wants to go this way, and then the tiger fish wants to go this way. And this was a style of fishing that I mean, I I I never done that. I mean, that's kind of a weird, you know, with running water and all that. So there'd be times that the bait end up behind the boat, and you know, it's under the boat. And through talking, communicating, like I said, he did. He he 
he knew enough English to be a good guide, but you're not going to have a, 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 you know, philosophical conversation with the guy, but that's not why you're there. But you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he, he understood. And that first day, I think we lost like four fish and I broke off two, which I ain't broke a fish off. And since you learned to fish, right. I mean, if you, you know what I'm saying? Like that's not a real common occurrence for, for pretty experienced people. You understand your drag, your line and what you're dealing with. And dude, they just pop gone. And I, I'd caught tigers in the Limpopo river, but they were smaller, five pounders, six pounders, not a whole lot of, you know, didn't have to worry too much about drag and all these kind of things. When we got here. I didn't really know what to expect. And I mean, we're pulling out 18s and 20s. This is not common at all. Like a 20 pound tiger is a, that's Pounds. Like the, okay. yeah. the pinnacle of like, if you got a 20 pound tiger, then you, Hey, you are a, a you're official great tiger fisherman, right? Yeah. I didn't know none of that. So the first few, two or three, four fish, it was chaos. Like, I'm like, what have I gotten into? Like, I don't, do I even know how to fish anymore? I mean, these things are just busting me off. Talk to my, and my wife with us, she, she ended up catching the lodge record, by the way, 24 and a half pounds. It's a 26 year old lodge record she broke. But anyway, Jeez. as we're talking back and forth, and just through experience of fishing in different places, he's having a really hard time communicating with her, but I'm picking up what he's, what he's telling us. And I'm telling her in not a language she understands, but in a scenario she understands. I'd say, hey, remember when we were in Florida and remember when we were fishing for, for clown knife fish and we were under that certain bridge and, we, and she's like, yeah. And then I said, do that you know, do, do it this way. And then she mm -hmm. starts figuring it out too. So by the next day, we're hammering tiger fish. I mean, this guy, the guy was even like, y'all never done this before. I said, no, but it, we fish a lot. We fish all yeah. over. So having just those skills and though, just a little bit of knowledge, you know, having some experience made that trip basically everything. Cause it would have took someone else probably another day and a half or two days to figure out the feel of what you're doing. A 10 yeah. inch live bait in a running river is not a common, you, you don't do that a lot. There's not a whole lot of people got a feel for that, mm -hmm. but these guys do. It's their only way they've ever fished though. So this is their expertise. So they have the knowledge to do it. It's just very hard to teach someone that in a, on a boat, on the river while you're trying to fish. And it, it, it worked out. In fact, we're going back next year to catch, uh, to fish for Nimue. And, and that, what that is the same body. It's what is that? It's like a, imagine a, a giant green tilapia. Just, it, they're massive. Oh, tilapia man. shaped. They, they're, they're like almost bright green. Got yellow kind of fins. You, you need to look them up, dude. It's a wild fish. I'm going to do it right now. How the hell do you even know, spell it? Uh, but the, you catch those in the rainy season, in the, in the high water season. So we, we had went for the big tigers. In the summertime, which is when you have to go, that's if you want to catch big, big tigers, and then that November, December is the is the time. But these fish here, you, you need to go in the in their winter, June, something like that. I see it. I see this fish. I have actually never even heard of these before. Wild looking, yeah. It looks like some yeah, kind of gnarly, there. crazy, like big mouth tilapia. Interesting. Yeah, they're 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 crazy fish, but you know, I mean, and this is one of the things like I was saying earlier, like. I didn't know I wanted to catch a Nimue. I, I knew what it was. That was it. I didn't realize that that was an, uh, an option. I said, you know, where we're at, I, I think I hooked one and lost it or something. Or it bit like one, and the guy said, Nimue, Nimue. And I was like, here? He goes, yeah, we, we catch Nimue in the, you know, in the, in the, in the rainy season. Yeah. And I said, I'll, I'll see you in the rainy season. Because, <laughs> let me, like I said, I mean, you're a fishing guy and you never, you didn't even know what this fish was. No. This, this is something that you would have never learned had you not been there. I didn't even know I ever wanted to catch a Nimue until I got to a place where they were. That, that's why I'm saying just go. There's so many things that, that like me, I, I don't have a lot of followers on Instagram. I don't post a lot on Instagram. But if you look through my phone, you know, you do like, my God, how do, how do I not know that that was? I'm like, I just, I don't know. I, anytime I, I do that, I kind of, and even now talking to you, I just feel like I'm like, I'm bragging like, oh, look at me. And that, that's not no, it no, at no. all. And I don't post things to say to, for people to go, oh, that's the greatest. I post things so that someone else would say, hey, man, where'd you get that? And is right. it available to me? Absolutely. I'll give you the name. I'll give it to you. I'll tell you the name of the lodge, the guy to call, and every contact when you want to go tiger fishing. Yeah. That's why I put it up there. It's not to say, look at me. It's so that 
hey, David might want to go catch one too. So here's some information if you need some more coffee. Oh, yeah. Well, I, but it's, I, man, it's it's so easy to snuff out like authenticity with, with that kind of stuff. You can tell when it's like, look at, you know, look at me type of thing. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, I definitely never heard like it's usually like the regional or like local names or like, you know, a, a fish like that. I would have never known, but I could take one look at it and know, okay, this is like in the cichlid family. This is a relative of the tilapia. We've got tilapia here and y'all got them in Texas. We have them in Florida. Yeah. Um, so it's like, oh, wow. So it's like, there's enough of a parallel between what, what I saw just then. And like what I've seen here that it's like got my interest, but I go back to the tiger fish. You mentioned it like breaking your line off. I was like, obviously, when you talk about these tiger fish, I mean the, the the legendary key characteristic is is the teeth. I mean, maybe the most impressive set of jaws of any freshwater fish in the world is, is the tiger fish. I mean, that's it, like the thing they have. But I like I, I look at a fish like that, and I look through all your photos, and I just I, you know, you think about like characteristics that some fish have. And you wonder, like, what is the functionality of that tool? Like, like, what, like the teeth. So, like, I don't, I can't tell from looking at it. Are they grabbing? Are they like grabbing teeth, or are they like cutting, like cutting? No, teeth? they're 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 pretty conical. They have a point, but they're not like a piranha, like a razor kind of edge. They're they're more like a sharp alligator tooth, right? Like a it's yeah. more it's rounded. And from from what I've seen, where they, they'll eat. You know, their, their jaws double hinge, right? Like the top jaw opens and the yes. bottom, right? Yeah. So their mouth can get huge. And they will try to fit the absolute biggest thing they can in that mouth. And so having, after we fish for them with these big giant baits, because, I mean, this dude's pulling out a 10, 10 inch long live bait. And I'm like, whoa, like the tiger fish I've caught in the past are five, six pounds. Like it's the thing would have to chew on this, right? But what happens is what they're doing I'm not saying this is what the teeth are for. I'm saying this is where I've seen them used is they take those big baits. They, they don't try to eat that bait. They come up there and they kill that bait or they cut that uh, bait in half. Yeah, like then they'll circle it. back around. Yeah. Then they'll circle back around and they'll pick it up. It, it, they can't eat that bait sideways or from the tail. They have to swallow it by the head. Yeah. Right? So they'll go up there, they'll wound it or they'll bite it in two and then they'll come back and they'll get the. Now, if you got a smaller bait and the reason I, that I know this is because I set the hook on a couple of them and I look at the guide and I was like, well, what's up? In my mind, the fish was too small for the bait that I had hmm. because all I seen was it bit, it bit it in half. And I was like, well, the, you know, our bait's too big. Right. That, that's the that's the conclusion you would come to. Right. After this happens three times, that's not the case. He goes, no, no, no. They can eat the bait. You got to wait till they come back and actually get the bait. They're they're killing it, and I'm setting the hook when they're killing. Oh, that's it, and I'm so interesting. Fish. And I'm getting mad. Like I'm like, how how the hell am I missing this fish? Like I fished before. This is stupid. And through a little communication and him giving me some hand signals and different things, I was like, ah, oh, now I got it. I've done this before. <laughs> I've done this with striper before. Live bait striper. The striper couldn't eat a big gizzard shad, and they would knock it up out of the water then circle back and eat it from the front. My mistake was setting the hook. Same exact thing. That's what yeah. I mean. Like if you get a little experience here or there, look, fish or fish or fish, big, big fish, eat little fish. I don't care if it's brackish water, running water, the, in my aquarium, you can stick me anywhere on this planet and give me a minute and I'll figure it out. Cause big fish eat little fish, right? Like it doesn't matter. Salt water, fresh water, start there. And then I, after I start figuring out like what's going on, I was like, well, that makes Take your bait out of the water and look at it. Don't just mm -hmm. get mad because it was bit in half. Look at this bait and it'll tell you a lot. Look at the fish. The fish alone will tell you a lot about the way they're feeding that day, about where they've been. I mean, you catch a fish with mud on his belly. He ain't been at the top, right? Like, yeah. you know, you, 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 you figure these things out. So I get the bait and I'm looking at it and I'm, and I'll look at the end and I ask him a couple of questions and I realize that this is what they're doing. They're killing these fish or they're biting them and then they're circling back and picking it up. Once I figured that out, I relate that to my wife. Hey, get ready on that drag because when they come back the second time, there's no nibble. There's no, it's zero to 60 in no seconds. I mean, they are flying. Yeah. <laughs> but this is something that's very hard for a local guy to relate to an American. Most of their clients are all South African. So when he, when I, when I started talking, he kind of looked back like, that's not the accent I expected. But again, like to your point, they, Americans just aren't, 
they're, they're surely not traveling to that part of, of Zambia in the middle of nowhere. I mean, yeah. literally, we, I mean, we got so far up the river at points that you didn't even see the grass huts no more. Like it was just as far in there as you could get. And that's where the biggest fish were and the biggest crocs and the biggest hippos. But still, that's part of the, that's why you go there. As far as the tiger fish themselves, like that hit is probably the hardest hit from, and I'm saying from zero. What I mean is there's no nibble. Like you don't, you don't think you have a bite. You either are holding your rod or your rod gets jerked from your hand. That's the yeah. two options. There's no <laughs> little pull, you know, like a channel cat. There's no, it's, it's dead still to as fast as it can go. Just, is this like a schooling they, species they, they, of fish? Or are they like solitary or are they moving in groups? Like I'm just fascinated in like small certain groups. Certain times of year, they're huge schools. So when the, when the catfish, the barbel, the barbel spawn, they, they get in huge schools and then the tiger fish get in huge schools, but they're, they're picking them off. The big, big fish, like a bit, the fish we're catching, there may be two or three in a group, but for the most part, the, these big ones I'm saying are solitary fish. The smaller fish need to school, though. I mean, they're living amongst, well, a million things that can eat them, crocs and everything else, you know. Yeah. So being a, a little six-inch long fish by yourself is a horrible idea, which is part of the reason this bait works so great. I mean, you launch this bait out in the middle of the river and it goes like, no, nah, this, is, this is not safe at all. So right. it takes off. <laughs> Which yeah. attracts the fish. That's how it kind of works. But it, yes, certain times of year they will get in schools, but I've only ever seen the smaller fish in schools. Like these 18, 16 to, to 20, 22 pounders, it, it usually you catch one out of a spot. You may catch one close, but not, they're not in a school per se that yeah. I've seen. But like I said, at different times of the year they do different things. But these fish are, these big, big fish that we're catching on the big live baits are, they're lazy. I mean, you don't get that big by chasing, chasing, chasing fish around, right? right. They kind of hang out. They'll kind of hang at the back of a, like the down, the, uh, down the current way of some schooling fish. And they just pick off wounded stuff. You know, it, it drips by, right? They're, they're smart. They know they're, you know, like humans get this way, right? The more knowledge you have, the less physical you have to be. You use your brain, work harder or work smarter, not harder, right? That's right. kind of the way these fish do. Like, you're not going to get to be a 22 pound tiger fish with that big old gut. If you're constantly fighting the flow of the river, chasing little baits around, they understand like, Hey, I'll let these kids go kill all these fish and wound them. And then as they come down, I'll just pick them off. You know, that's kind yeah. of the way the, that's kind of how we fished them was, was like, if you could find a little point, kind of a sandbar or something that paints the water down a little bit, you know, they're in there facing you know, up that river because that's that's kind of that's the funnel of of fish, and you can flip that thing up there. And it, and I may be reading too much into it, but at times I was like, I think this bait knows this too because I would throw it in there, and he would just go, and just gone from that spot. Uh, yeah, he was probably like, no, dude, I'm, I know what's going to happen down there. <laughs> but it, it, you needed. It, it's hard to go to places like that remote and not have some sort of, of knowledge or some sort of experience. You could do it very easily. I'm saying fishing experience, not traveling, but it like like the, the live bait thing and talking to the guys. That would have been very, very hard for someone who hasn't had a lot of experience fishing to figure out. And I only figured it out because I caught striper that way here in Texas before. So I kind of, you know, I probably figured it out a little faster than some guys did, but it... You're on your own a lot, even though you have a guide, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You know, like, yes, there's a guide on the boat, but as far as like the fishing part goes, he can only explain so much. And at some point you just have to go catch the fish, right? Like he can tell you all the ways to do it, but if you don't actually do it, you're not going to learn as much as just him telling. Right. So you need some sort of a skill to kind of get you going in the right direction and then it helps to have someone else with like like my wife being there helps a lot because I'm like, hey, remember that time? And she's like, yeah, do that. She don't need to know why. She just needs to understand if I do this, I'm catching a fish, right? And then yeah. we can explain this all later. But I, I wouldn't advise like for, for someone who just wants to just go straight into big adventures, be careful. Like I, I wouldn't like take my first trip to Zambia. Right. Yeah. Take your first trip to Thailand. Take you take go to Thailand. You can go fish wild if you want, but you can also go fish in the lake. Look, catching a fish in the lake to some people like, oh, I could never do that. You still have to catch a fish. You're still going to learn how fish fight. You're still going to learn how they feel. You're still going to learn how they eat. 
like all of that's the same, regardless of whether it's a wild Araprima in, in South America or whether it's one in a 20 acre lake in Thailand, you can still yeah. learn from that fish. Look, I would a lot rather go catch wild fish too, but I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to learn something or learn something about a fish because now let's say I, I didn't do that in Thailand. And then I head down to South America and I lose a fish over something stupid that I could have learned had I just done it here. Does that make sense? Like yeah, yeah, you know, all of the knowledge you can from everywhere. It's similar to like the peacock bass here in Florida uh, or, or the clown knife fish, which, you know, it's like, well, they're, that's like saying, oh, I'm not going to go catch the peacock bass in Florida because it, it's not South America. It's like, well, you know, some people don't have, I don't know, the finances to go there quite yet, but it's still an opportunity to, to encounter the animal or the fish. Absolutely. But, um, so I'm curious though, like when you're there, I understand, I think the bigger part of some of these trips was hunting and like fishing was like a, maybe a side quest or it may have been of equal importance to you. But you know, when you're hunting that that's all in the name of, of, of food and sustenance and, and you know, it's like, there's one way that that goes now fishing on the other hand, this is the part that always fascinates me. Were you doing like catching and release fishing or catching? I'm curious, like what were they thinking when you're like, Hey, I want to come all the way here from halfway across the world to catch this fish, look at it and then put it back in the water. Like what, what, what are they, what, what is you their opinion what on thinking. that? <laughs> you know exactly what they're thinking. Here's the, here's the deal. It, it's very, there's very few situations I've been in or I put myself in where I, I kind of have a moral, I don't know what I'm saying, like a tug of war, right? Like I pretty much am what I am. And I know that when I get to a spot, it, you know, whether it's a, a, a giraffe, an elephant or all those animals that we talked about, I know I was there. I understand the situation and every situation is different. Like, look, everything is not equal. You can't just lump everything into a pile. My situation with a draft was different than another guy's situation with a draft. I can't judge what he did. But on the Zambezi, I was, I mean, I, I was torn. I, I, I really was, every day you're driving up and down the river, you're passing a dozen guys in, in dugout canoes pulling nets all day. And, and I've been there when they pulled up at the end of the day and they literally have 25 tilapia that are between six inches and 10 inches long Ooh. for their day. Yeah. Okay. That's what they're going to eat today. That's what the family eats today. That's what he did today. That's his job. Provide for his family. And he did that. It's awesome. My deal was I'm sitting on the river watching this guy pull his net for hours, catching six inch long fish. And I'm over here catching 10, 15, 20 pound fish that I know would feed that family for a week. Yeah. And I'm throwing it back. But my, 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 the, 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 the qualm I had with it was if I, if I give the fish to the guy to eat, now my guide who's making money, his resource is being depleted because his job and he's bringing money into the community is to catch trophy fish. If I take all the trophy fish and feed them to the village, which I want to do because I see they're struggling. Now I've, I've cut this guy's job out in time, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah, so yeah. It really weighed on me like what I hated looking. I hated looking across the river onto the bank and see a guy fishing with a cane pole. And I watched him put, they called squeakers. There's little tiny catfish about this big. You, put, you take it out of the water and it goes, hey, it's a squeaker. I watched yeah. him put squeakers in a basket for an hour. Not one of them was over eight inches long. I just throw back a 10 pound tiger fish and he's looking me right in my eye. Dude, I, I felt horrible. But at the same time, if I give it to him and I have to look at my guide and say, sorry, your next client doesn't have the option of catching a trophy fish because I just fed it to this guy. Yeah. So it, you see what I'm getting at? It's like, so here's what I did. This made me feel better. I did it. And I, I try not to be a selfish guy. I, I leave all my tackle, everything I take when I go places, I leave it. I, all oh, my fishing. Gear, yeah, that's all cool. That stays there. That's, like, that's part of a tip that I give to those guys because that's something that they would never buy with the tip money you gave. Mm -hmm. You you give them a tip, they need that money to survive. They're never gonna. I picked up equipment before, and you know, technically the guy's right. Hey man, you got a rod and reel? Yeah, no problem, right here. And I'm like, it, I mean, technically it's a rod and reel, but are we gonna catch a fish on this? No. You know, fishing line alone is is just like from where we were. I said, hey, on the way back to the airport, stop by a tackle shop, and I'll get enough line to fill up all of your reels. 
He said, okay. I said, well, is it on the way? And he goes, no. He said, it's about three hours. And I'm like, man, that's, that's a long ways out of the way. And he goes, no, it's three hours in the boat. It's six hours in the truck. That's the fishing line. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is not to the to the big city where we can go out and have a nice dinner and, and, and have a date. This is to go get fishing line. We're three hours away. I leave everything because this is not something they have access to. Now, whether they use it or not, I don't know. But to me, at least if it's available, you know, maybe they can figure it out. Maybe they don't know how to operate a baitcaster, whatever, whatever it is. But it's better than what they have. And it's surely better than what they would buy because they need all the money they got just to live. That is uh, that is really really cool. I would never have thought about that, but it's like a, you know, it's almost like a, it's almost like a real time example of that old adage, like you know, give a guy a fish versus teach a guy to fish That's type exactly of thing. Exactly what it is. I'm like, that's really really neat. And even if they can't cast a bait caster, it's like, the, I mean, figure it how, out. how many yards of line are on that spool that can be stripped off the hooks and and all that stuff. That's or or it's like. You can either give a guy on the side of the road a twenty dollar bill, or you can give him a job. You know, it's like that kind of <laughs> that kind of thing. Eh, that's well, really like, cool. I I like that idea, man. I would. So I would. Here's the way I do it. Like we just got back two weeks ago from the Eastern Cape. We only fished a day or two there. We caught a few barbels in the in the Kai River, right right on the Indian Ocean. Kill a bunch of animals. Had a big time. Everybody's happy. Now we're back. I started yesterday buying crankbaits. Because that's what they fish for Nimue with. Mm -hmm. Big crankbaits. I go to Academy or, or whatever. Hell, Walmart, doesn't matter. But you're going to come across something on sale. It's not something, I, I may not use that here, but they'll use it somewhere I go. Yeah. And I start buying. So I go to Walmart or, or the, wherever you're at. Let's just say Walmart. And you need three things from the grocery section. I swing through. I grab two crankbaits. My bill that was $12 is now $18. That's not, that's not, has any, that has no bearing on my day or my finances. But at the end of a year, buying two crankbaits, three crankbaits a week, I'm going to have three tackle boxes full. Right. And at no point did I consciously go spend $600 on bait, even though I know it, that's what it is there. But, but just doing that two or three dollars at a time for a crankbait, a, a, some hooks, some line. Then when I take it all over there, we fish with it for the week or the three, three days, four days, and then I leave it all there. And then yeah. when I come back, I, I do it all over again. Right now, I've, got, I've only got three crankbaits right now that I'm taking to Zambia, but I have three crankbaits. Yeah. You know? Well, it's funny because you, you think of how often you piss away money on things that are, are, are one-time use anyway. Like you go to the gas station and you grab a, you know. It's funny because I'm probably the worst about this. <laughs> if I added up how many like little bags of potato chips and packs of gum and like oh, drink yeah. that I didn't need and I just wanted and like the end of the year, how much that could have gone towards something else. It's pretty shocking and pretty sad. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, that's and, and there's there's no amount of money you can place on what it's worth to those people. You oh, know, my gosh. Yeah, I, I've got video. <laughs> of the guide when i handed him the box we were still in the boat we were about to head back and the, the last day there i said hey man because like i said i'd kind of been struggling with the like do we eat these fish i want to just throw them all back right like it's not a big deal but i also understand after having been there a week or so like the way these people are living right so i said to the guy i said hey we're going we're going meat fishing today and he he, he didn't understand and i said we're let's go catch catfish i didn't mm -hmm. i didn't really want to 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 give them all the tigers the, and, they, and they, they'll catch the tigers in their nets, but I would rather them have the barbels, the catfish, and they don't care. Look at they, there's no preference to them. They're not going to say, no, I don't want the tiger. Give me the barbel. They're going to say, yes, I'll take all of the meat. Yeah. So I said to the guy, I'm like, it ain't about me today, brother. I've been watching these guys. I mean, it's, it's like, I'm almost getting emotional at times going like, Thinking of the, this guy's day, you know, he wake up at five o'clock, he gets in his P-Row, he has to fight a freaking crocodile just to go fishing. Ugh. And then I'm throwing fish back and he's just looking at me like, dude, I'm, I've been here for eight hours. I've got four fish this long and, I, and I'm just tossing. You know what I mean? So yeah. I said, it ain't about me. I said, we're going to hit every one of those little huts and villages that we've seen up and down this river. And, it, and it, every one of them is going to get at least one fish. Mm. So what we went to the end. We caught a catfish immediately. I took it straight to the bank. I'd have yelled at them, hey, I got video. They're just running yeah. down. <laughs> and I'm holding up fish. And then we'd drift along and catch another one, and we'd see a hut, and I would take it to them. 
I don't know how much it meant to them, and maybe it was a selfish thing to think it made me feel better, but that's kind of how I justified it in my mind. Like, I think I can make everyone happy if I do it this way. Yeah. And my wife was like, it's a great idea because, look, the guy still gets paid. These people are getting fish, you know. And, and, and most importantly to me is I left on a good note. Like, I, I wasn't just the loudmouth white dude that threw all of our food back. Right. When I go back there next year, I'll promise you when I hit that river, there's going to be someone come out and go, hey, I remember you. They've only probably ever seen two or three white people anyway. And if you're running along giving them fish, they don't forget those things. Especially one that's – especially a guy that's six foot four with a big beard and long well, hair. Like, that, <laughs> <but> <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've scared some kids just being there. They just yeah. run off into the hut. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, no, no, no. You'd be surprised. And I say things jokingly, but – I mean, I've come, I've come in contact with several kids who've never seen a white guy at all, and some who have seen white guys, but not with a beard or hair. Mm-hmm. And they want to touch it, or or is it? They'll say to their parents, "Is it like? Is it like ours? You know that kind of." And it's it's hilarious. I love yeah. it, dude. I yeah. love it because <laughs> I love it for the kids first because that's something they're going to remember. But for me, it tells me like you've gotten, you've gone to some remote spot. If you go so far back in there, you scared a kid because you're the first white person he's ever seen that you you went a long ways back in the wilderness. And that's where I want to be. I right. want to be back in there as far as I can get. So if I scared kids a little bit, sorry, kid. But that to me is like, no, I made it like this is where I need to be right here. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of, one of the things when I was reading through like some of your blogs, because it's like you could have very easily just write about the fishing and the hunting and like leaving out some of the extra stuff. But like one thing that kind of like, you know, I don't know. It's like, ah, I got to write, I got to ask about this. You described this desire to be barefoot. And I watched the videos. I watched the YouTube videos and everything. Like you're walking around in the bush barefoot. Why is that? Like what, what, what was the urge to be barefoot? I thought that was such an interesting thing. I'm like, okay. It's like, you know, I kind of get it, but like, this is clearly, it was like, I could tell it was like a meaningful part of the trip that you like wanted to have happen to be barefoot out there. There's a one thing to me, just being around different people. I feel like the, like the, if I can, those people can relate to me more if I'm doing more what they're doing, those people are running around barefooted and I show up and I'm, I look like I just, you know, a Cabela store puked on my back and I got all the greatest stuff. Yeah. We can't relate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, I, like to them, I'm a separate species. Like what is this guy even wearing? He, he won't even get his feet dirty. Like I have to bait his hook mm. that you can do that. You can go that way, but that's, you're not going to get the best. What I've learned is, to get the best out of any guy or, or whoever you're with, they have to have, they have to be enjoying it too. Yeah. Now, you, you don't, you know what I'm saying? And the more they can relate to the, to your thought process, the more they can relate to you as a person, the more you're going to get out of those people. So if I got to take my shoes and my shirt off, and then we're just going to go stomping through that stuff and fight a python, which happened, then that's what we're going to do because yeah. that's what they do. And then the more I do what they do, the more they want to do for me. They're like, you know what? This guy's not an asshole. Like most Americans show up. This guy will go sleep in a grass hut. This guy will chop a pot yeah. head off with a machete yeah. and we'll eat it tonight. Like <laughs> that to them, because most of the clients, most of the people that show up there, they're, they're so different in the, in the way their life is and, the, and what they do. They kind of look down a lot on which is totally wrong, but you know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of hunters, yeah. like I, I'll go with hunters and they, they like look down on the tracker. Like mm. dude, that tracker knows more about what you're doing than you, than you can even fathom. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, what you're doing is, is barely practice to this guy. I've, I've seen trackers track a single animal over three days for eight and a half miles and find it. 90% of the Americans that show up. Okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to not be too negative here. I'm just, trust me. <laughs> yeah. <when I> tell you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that these people, the people that they're looking down on, it it blows my mind because I'm like, if you knew, if you had half of the hunting or fishing knowledge that this guy has, like your 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 places would swap. Mm-hmm. He would be looking down at you like that's not the way they think. But they're ninety percent of the people that show up, they have to cater to. They don't relate to. They're nice. I'm not saying that these people are rude. What yeah. I'm saying is they can't relate. So if I I'm running around and I I did it last time I still do it I like being barefooted but to them that they look over and they're like hey this guy ain't scared 
Like this, this is this guy's different. He bakes his own hook. He knows his own spot that he, you know, hey, that looks like a good spot. He's barefooted like us. I'll sit down and eat with him. Like right, yeah. That's how you get more out of uh, enjoyment for you, but enjoyment for the people you're with. You're you're gonna have a really really long week. If as soon as you get in from whether it's your hunt or your fishing or whatever, and your guy takes off this way and you take off this way and you don't see him again till the next morning when you meet at the boat, that's not going to be a good week. You may catch a few fish, but that's not going to be a good week because right. fishing is a fraction of what you're doing or hunting is a fraction of what you're doing. The 80% of, of the rest of it is what you need to be enjoying too, because it's going to make a not a good trip. You need to be able to relate to people and Hey, I show up and they ain't got shoes on and they're swimming in that river. Count me in. Oh, yeah. that's props. <laughs> well, they're doing it. Look, no one wants to die. I don't care what size, shape, or color you are. No one's looking to die. Right. right? So when I go into a village and they're all swimming, I'm like, well, I'm swimming. I, I mean, I might stand out a little more underwater to a crop, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. like, these people aren't out here. If they're in that much danger, they wouldn't be there. Just yeah. be smart about it. They, you know, don't try to show people up, but they, the barefooted – Barefoot in Africa just sounds cooler to me anyway. You got, you know, red sands under your feet, right? I'm standing in the track of an elephant. And that's a, you know what I'm saying? Like I put my foot right in an elephant's track and take a picture. I saw the photo of that. I thought that was so cool. That's just something that's not, it, it, look, would it have been any different with a shoe on? Hell, I don't know. But the fact of the matter was the last thing that stood there was a wild elephant and then me. (laughs) You know, you, you just can't do that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like even people that hunt elephants or hunt or conservation guys that track elephants and keep up, that's what they do every day. I get it, but even they aren't like stopping as we don't. Me and you don't. Yeah, Americans don't. Slow down and look around. We don't do that. But what I'm saying is, just to know that the last thing that stood there was a big bull African elephant that could be right around the next tree and come out and kill you if it wanted to, right. and then for me to stand there barefooted and touch that just I, you feel more connected like you feel like now i'm part of this yeah. you know what i mean like you always want to be a part of the surroundings not stand out and, and to me i just felt more like i'm in, i'm in there i'm doing what I, I should be doing i'm i'm hanging out with natives instead of just saying all right guys we'll see you in the morning yeah that ain't what i want to do well, you also described, <laughs> I like loved reading this stuff because like, man, this is like, this is so, it like transcends so far beyond just fishing and hunting. And that's always what I like to see and read. But you described at one point, like, like walking and pacing, just, just like going for a walk at night in Africa. And you may have been barefoot during that too. And hearing like the sound of a warthog being killed by a leopard. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, man, I just like. You know, you can see this stuff on TV and like you can you can read about it in like National Geographic. But it's like I'm just like I try to put myself like in in position to like envision something like that, like an experience like that. And like how impactful that 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 could be at like this core guttural level. But it's also like a scary thing. It's weird. It's like you need to be scared every so often. But it just speaks to how raw and like how powerful that that place well, is that. <laughs> you need Some, to be scared. Something but, is dying out there. Like exactly. But I'll tell you the way, and this is the way they think. Like the Africans think, the villagers there think. Like that night, the the word the first thing was the baboons. Baboons start screaming. They're they're you know raising all kinds of hell. I know this. I mean, there's a leopard hunting tonight. Like that baboons and leopards, mortal enemies, right? Everyone knows this. Well, mm. baboons are, you know, they throw rocks in there, raising all kinds of hell. Then I hear silence in the warthog and i know exactly where this thing is i mean it's not far but when i got back to the camp and i go into the tent and one of the ladies says that everyone can this is it's it's a, it was like a passing comment but if you think about what she said you realize just how much like their lives are different and how much you really are in danger at all times she says well at least the at least we can sleep good tonight because the leopard has already caught a warthog. Yeah. He's and I'm like, okay, yeah. But then as I thought about it, I'm like, what do you mean by it? And she goes, well, if the leopard ate tonight, he won't be hunting again. So meaning we're in a tent. If the leopard gets hungry enough or you step out to pee or whatever, you could be the warthog. But once he's eaten, they get more comfortable. Like we can sleep better tonight because the yeah. local leopard has had a meal. 
Like, do you understand the, the like the worst thing that anyone around here has to worry about is not waking <laughs> up on time. These right. people have to worry about not waking up, period. Like mm-hmm. a leopard just grabbed you because he couldn't catch a warthog. So it was it was it was like the sound of that death to them was was a calming. Hey, we'll get a good night's sleep. And it wow. was just a weird reaction because I'm like, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it, it it totally makes sense. But you, me, most people you know never would have took that angle. You know, they never they'd have been oh, I, like I'm I'm scared. It's wild to look at these these creatures. And well, they know that once that leopard ate, and and you know probably not another leopard near. They know this. They know these animals. They're like, hey, his belly's full. Let's go to sleep. And it was just like it hit me like. I'm like, oh my God, I never, that, you would never take that angle to that thought process unless you were there living that, living in that tent or in that hut. Yeah. Just like you said, like, man, I can't believe like these, it's, it's raw and it's primal and it is, but to them it's survival. Mm -hmm. Let him go eat a baboon or a warthog so I can sleep. Otherwise they're constantly on guard. If you hear a leopard hunting and you didn't hear him catch something, they're like, ah, crap, you know? Yeah. (laughs) could be us right like that's right. that's the way they think and and they should think that way yeah. i mean you don't always get a good night like one night you're trying to sleep in the tent and the elephant pulls the the water we had a like a water barrel you know gravity feed water outside the tent he just breaks the pipe off and gets him a drink well, <laughs> that's funny wow. haha no it ain't all the water in the whole village is gone. yeah you know that's a that's a different it's awesome i love it I don't know how long I could stay. Like people say, why don't you just move there? I don't think, I think like those people, I'm not saying they don't appreciate it, but I'm saying they take a lot for granted. Like, like we do where we're at, but I don't want to be, I don't want to live there because I want to appreciate it more. And I feel like that you don't appreciate your surroundings where you're home. Right. Right. I got alligator gar one hour from my house. You know how many people in this world would love to go, man, I can't believe you're not fishing for them every weekend. Yeah. Take that for granted. I've caught them. All right, let's, let's go somewhere else, right? This is the way they do. I want to appreciate it more. And, and the going every other year or, or whenever it is, you'll appreciate it a whole lot more. You notice more things. You're, you're really tuned in to every bird, every everything, because it's all new. And, and you, you want to refresh all those memories you had of the last time you were in Asia or the last time you were in Africa. And you, you pay attention more. I just feel like if it was a, something that you did constantly, you would miss a lot of, of the best parts, you know, to me. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's, it's all like great perspective stuff. And like, sometimes when I think about these scenarios where we'll, you know, we might go over there to experience what, what, what they do. I also sometimes wonder like, well, what if like, how crazy it would be if like the, like the script was reversed and one of those guys had the opportunity to come to your home and hunt the, and hunt the way you hunt and you almost like return the favor. Right. Um, and you described one thing that I got a real kick out of mentioning. Uh, I think you let one of the guy you let one of the guys borrow a pair of polarized sunglasses. And it's like <laughs> how how that like, man, like, he is so curious by that. I'm like, so it, interesting. Two Two things happened there. First of all. I'd, I'd caught several fish. And like I said, it, look, it's running water. I'm fishing for a catfish. The rules are basically the same worldwide. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying. Like, they're, they're not in the middle of the river facing down. They're, by, they're, they're in a log jam facing up. That's what catfish do in the whole wide world. So it's not that it, I know how to catch every fish in the whole wide world, but I'm not an idiot. I throw yeah. my bait upstream of a log jam and let it drift in there tight and then I suck it down there and I pull a catfish out of there. That's what you would do at any creek or any river. Well, I did this a couple of times and these guys are like, oh man, and I'm trying to, they're, they're hunters, they're trackers, they don't do a lot of fishing. And uh, and I'm explaining to them like kind of how this, you know, look, fish are facing this way, food's coming this way and, they, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. And they're, and they're buying into this, right? And, and I'm not lying to them, I'm just telling them, they're, they're learning. And there was some little school of bait fish and I, I didn't know what it was. And I kept seeing them shoot by. And I kept asking the guys, like, what is that? He was actually our skinner. You know, he, he skinned our, skin our animals, but he, he's with us. He's driving and whatever. And I kept asking. I was like, do you know what those are? He said, I can't even see them. So I handed him my glass. And I realized then, I'm like, oh, I got, I always wear, well, you've seen the picture. I wear polarized Ray-Bans, right? So I, yeah. put a, I, I took them off and I handed them to him. 
when I realized he can't see because, you know, he don't have polarized glasses. So he puts them on and, and, and freaks out immediately. He's like, oh, oh, oh. And he yeah. goes, how? <laughs> he kept saying, how, how? And I'm like, how, what? He goes, how, how does it work? I'm like, dude, I don't know how it works. Just can you see the fish now? And he's like, yeah, those are whatever fish. And then it, it clicked and you could see it. It was so funny because he his face kind of went serious. And then he looked at me and he goes, so you can see all them fish you're catching. And I'm like, no, no. No. Yeah. So all yeah. of a sudden, he, I went from like this great fisherman to, well, this is cheating. You're just looking at him. I'm like, no, that's yeah. <laughs> so he hands them to the next guy, oh, and the man. next guy, and the next guy. And I tell my wife, I was like, I, I don't even know if this is a thing, but I hope there's not like any like nose herpes or anything because I'm going to have them because the 30 yeah. guys that put this pair of glasses on. <laughs> like, I have no idea where they went. They yeah. circle, made a circle and come back in 30 minutes, you know. But <laughs> That's something you don't even think about. Like, I've never even seen one of them wear sunglasses. They know what they are, but obviously, they've never seen polarized glasses looking in the water. Yeah. So, this, when I gave him those, it was just like this. And it was a new world to him because he had never seen the guys lived 35 years in Africa right on that river and never even seen these fish underwater. He had no way of doing it. And now, all of a sudden, I give him these glasses and it's like a whole new river to him. He's, he's just walking up down the river, pointing at things, telling me what all this stuff is. And I was like, man, this is that. It, it was. Just, it's just cool. Again, reminds you of, of the things you take for granted. Like, yeah, the last thing I ever would have thought that would have entertained a, a group of villagers for an hour would have been polarized sunglasses. Right. Right. Yeah. Like think <laughs> people are like, oh, you need to, you need to take them a, so a, a ball, take them a soccer ball, take them a frisbee, take them some food, or some Ray Bans. Like no one's ever done that. But man, they, it was so awesome to see them be able to see something that they live right right amongst and never never had been able to see it before yeah ne never been able to see those you know those fish that kind of schooled up under there they never knew that that was a thing it it's was just, just it's funny how you're sort of like trading experiences for things or like you know you mentioned giving people fish giving people fishing rods giving them fishing lures and you're obviously getting some things out of that as well whether it be experiences or some cool photos or or whatever but then you know i guess on this topic too um before i kind of like i could sit here and talk all day about the africa thing but it's i like, got oh, all day <laughs> well we've also it's like you know there's so much more beyond just that one but that one's like um there's just so much material there to talk about but um you sent me that photo today yesterday recently where it was like a pair of i guess you'd call them shoes flip-flops yeah, yeah. made yeah. out of tire treads i don't remember now this was given to you Per your request, or there was like right. a, a so, transaction made. Tell me about that. We were hunting zebra. I got me and zebras don't get along. I know people think it's you know because if they're drawn in a cartoon, they're tame, right? Well, that ain't the case. Trust me. The, yeah. You got people got to remember these things. These animals live amongst leopards, lions, and everything wants to kill them. Okay, you are the weakest predator that's really after them. You know, everything else is pretty serious. So anyway, we're tracking zebras three days, two days. I don't know. It was a long time. It's, and, and we're, we get to this certain spot. We're walking up the side of this hill, and I see wheelbarrow, like tire tracks, on just a little bit of sand. I, I'd seen guys gathering firewood earlier in the week, so I, all right, that explains that, right? I mean, they they wheelbarrowed up here, they got some firewood. Then later, I've seen it again and again, and then I'm like, something's not right here. Like they ain't pushing a wheelbarrow to here. And it's all the you know the straight line tracks of a, yeah, of a wheelbarrow, yeah. right? I'm like, something is. What is going on here? So anyway. We get around a day or two later, and I, I they were skinning my uh, they were skinning giraffe, and they use every when I say everything I mean everything cut the stomach contents out take all of the organs put it inside the stomach tie a knot throw it over their shoulder and off into the bush they go every piece uh -huh. okay when he cut this thing open it, it like it's kind of nasty but it, the, like the contents of the stomach kind of ran down. And I, and I glanced down to, you know, to move out of the way. And I looked and realized that that was his shoe, his shoe print that I was seeing up there. I looked down at his sandals. They were made out of a tire. They were made out of a wheelbarrow tire. And that wheelbarrow track that I thought was people gathering firewood was him. He was tracking. And huh. so I, and I asked him about it and he almost got embarrassed, which I, that was not my intention in any way. But he more or less, they just took some scrap leather and couple of nails and some rivets and, and and cut a tire in the shape of his foot and, and made him a pair of shoes. And I asked him, well, what about the shoes I seen you in yesterday? 
He says, those are my driving shoes. These are, these are my hunting shoes. So yeah. his hunting shoes, the ones that he needed, that he preferred to hunt in, were a wheelbarrow tire and a scrap of leather. And it, it was just the coolest thing ever to me. And I asked him, I said, do you want a new pair of shoes? And he said he loved them, but he just, he didn't have the means to get them. And I said, I'll make you a deal right now. I said, I'll, I'll buy you a new pair of shoes, but you got to give me those. And he, he said, no, you don't want these. And I said, no, I absolutely want those. Yeah. And he goes, it's just, it's, just an old, it's just an old wheelbarrow tire and some leather. And I said, I know. And it's the greatest pair of shoes and story I've ever seen. Dude, I'll buy you whatever shoes you want if you give me those. And, right. I, and I asked the PH later, I said, how long, his name is Betwell. I said, how long has Betwell had those shoes? And he's like, five, six years. I said, do you understand the amount of Africa these things have been on? Yeah. Like, do you understand the amount of animals, the miles, the scenarios he's been in, the just not obviously those shoes can't tell a story, but to me, they, they, there's it, it, Africa's inside of there. I mean, yeah. it's so like they literally will take anything to make anything. And it, there's nothing wrong with them. Like, if your kid were in the school, yeah, they'll get laughed out of the school. That's wrong. Like, the rubber tire is going to outlast your Air Jordan spread. <laughs> you know, times 10. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's about practicality. It's not about look at me. And so I, what I ended up doing is I, this isn't all of them, but on occasions you'll run across a skinner or a tracker who, if he gets a little spare money, might get drunk and not show up the next day. So, I, so I said to the, to one of the guys at the lodge, I said, I, I'm going to, I'll get, you know, buy your gas. I want you to drive Betwell to town and I want you to buy him any pair of shoes he wants because I'm taking his shoes. And he's like, what are you talking about? So I tell him, they're like, you're an idiot. I'm like, no, I, call me an idiot if you want, but right. show me one other person that has that. Right. Show me one other souvenir in this world that someone has that. Like, yeah. it's not me saying I have something you don't have. It's me saying I have an experience you don't have. You could have it. It's there for you too. Like, it's not like I'm the only guy allowed in these places. But my point is, is when I show people that, I'm like, look, this is what I'm talking about. This yeah. is what I'm telling you. That that story happened the same day that I hunted a giraffe. And I, and I ain't even telling the giraffe hunting story because it ain't as cool. You know what I mean? Like, this is why I go. I never yeah. in my life would have dreamed that I would be standing in Africa next to a guy skinning a giraffe in a wheelbarrow shoe. Like, who the hell yeah. even come up with that? Oh, you know, that's awesome. not... It, it, it's just there's so many little things that people don't even know i mean what's the saying you don't know what you don't know right like that's it's so foreign to most people and it, there's a lot of things still foreign to me but like things like that don't surprise me anymore i still love it but just just the just the fact the dude made it out of the it was a junk tire no it's not it's a new pair of shoes like your yeah. perspective on that item is ask a guy it was uh he was a skinner I said, uh, Simone, what size shoe do you wear? Again, he, he got embarrassed. And I said, what's wrong? He didn't know what size shoe he wore, and he was embarrassed to tell me. I said, I, that's fine. I, I was going to – I had a pair of boots my wife had worn, and I, he's about the same size. I was going to give them to him. So I go ask the PH, and I said, hey, you know, what's about what size shoe does Simone wear? And he's like, I don't know. He goes, what do you got? And I'm like, well, I got a pair of boots here, but, I, you know, I want them to fit. And he goes, it doesn't matter. I said, it absolutely matters. And he goes – if they're too big, they're just going to wear them anyway. And if they're too little, they'll cut the toe out. And I said, yeah. well, isn't that just running this nice pair of boots? And he goes, would you rather have 90% of your foot covered or 0% of your foot covered? And I'm like, this, this is why y'all are better people than me. This is why you're a survivor and I'm not. Because that dude would cut the end of that boot out to cover most of his, his foot instead of walking around barefooted that makes practical sense right that's what you should do that's what i should do but that's not the way we think we don't we're like oh you run a pair of boots this guy's like hell i just covered 90 percent of my foot this is the greatest day ever yeah like, that's the difference in in just the way we think we as americans but you you don't even know that you and you need to know that you need to know that because when you get back over here you start thinking different like the way you the way you operate, the way you live your daily life, the, what you think is important is not. And you realize that when you go spend time with these people. Like the, the guys in Zambia are, are everything that we pay to be. And by that, I mean, they eat healthy. They eat tilapia and whatever roots and berries they can pick. Go buy a salad. What do you, we pay $9 for what they're getting for free. They don't have to go to the gym. They're pulling nets all day. 
They stand up in a P-row, basically, you know, a dugout canoe, and they're pulling a net. You know the core strength it takes to stand up in that boat and then pull? Yeah. Every one of these guys look like an Under Armour commercial. They're just six-pack, just cut, huge. It'll work out. That vitamin yeah. D they get all day, we're all deficient in. Like it, It's like the lifestyle they have is what we have gotten away from, and then we have to pay to get back. It makes no sense. You know, you know like eating healthy, they do that. Working out, they do that. Sunshine outside fresh air they do that but they do that because they have to we do that because we've taken away taken that away and now we have to go back and buy it now we have to go back and pay for the gym membership makes no sense those people are healthier and happier than most any american i know and they're just doing what they're supposed to do in nature and you think i guess how long like you know the 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 game and fish lasts from the time it's harvested to the time it's on the plate it's like it's like straight to consumption there's not all this crap in it it's right. not you know it's just nuts to think about and there's that. no there's no refrigeration so if it's preserved it's preserved in salt or air dried which mm-hmm. either way is still straight from the you know that's basically raw right yeah like we caught a I, now i did give one guy one tiger fish one time but i had to strike another deal because i had a, a, a spring hair i don't know if i told you this a spring hair is like a tiny little kangaroo and i caught one one night and, the, and whenever I, I picked it up, I turned around. This dude's got a knife. He's trying to stick it. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa hey, I, hey. I read this. You didn't have to tell me. I read this part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling him. I'm like, well, you know, what are we doing here? And he's like, it's food. I'm like, we've got a lot of food. You know, I, I, I killed like a wildebeest the day before. I'm like, dude, we got enough meat. But they can't even comprehend why. Well, why would you turn meat loose? We're eating what's here right now. Like, they're yeah. not thinking about the wildebeest. They're thinking about this is food right here. And I said, look, here's the deal. I'll give you a tiger fish tomorrow if you'll let me turn this spring hair. And he wasn't happy about it, but he did it. And and I had to, I held up to my end of the deal and I give him a tiger fish. Well, he took, takes that tiger fish and cuts the head off, opens it up, pulls the bones out where it's just open like a like an open sandwich, right? Like two pieces, but still connected and salted it and put a stick through it and then hung it in a tree like a wind chime. And it spun around up in that tree in the shade in the wind for a day and a half. And I was like, there's no way I'm eating that. Like, I, that, that's that, yeah. just, just because they eat it, they, they, I've learned this with food and water. They have immunities to things we don't have, right? Just like if they come over here, they're, you know, you know the whole story. But I was like, I don't know if that's safe for me. But I ate it two days later and it was outstanding. Yeah. But the salt, put a crust on the thing where the flies and bugs can't get to it. The skin was still on it on the other side. Nothing could, now it's not going to last for a week this way, but two days, little salt and, and, and air, it was fine. And my wife's like, you, you've lost your mind if you're going to eat that fish. And I'm like, look, they're eating it. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm eating it. I eat it. I take a bite. It's good. It's not just, Hey, you can eat it. It's actually good. So I like here, try a piece. And she's like, wow, that's, uh, that's a different flavor and texture. I said, I know, but look at the way it's preserved. Look at the, what they're doing. You know, if you leave your leftovers out overnight, your wife's probably dumping that the next morning. I, you know, we, we ate a fish had been in a, in a tree for two days. It's fine. There's no reason for us to throw away 90% of what we throw away is what I'm getting at. Like if you have any knowledge at all on how to preserve anything other than throw it in the fridge, that's what we do. We throw it in the fridge. Yeah. You know, we can leave it in there for a week. You know, no, it's no good now. And you throw it away. That's not the way they live. They live fresh the way you're supposed to. Like, this is the way you're supposed to eat. I mean, you're not, you should only eat things that go bad, right? Like, when you buy something with so much preservatives that you can leave it on the counter for a week and come back and it's still good, that can't be good for you. <laughs> no. Like, you know, it's they funny. right off the land. I don't know if you healthy. saw, I saw one a while back. It made, like, national news. There was, like, I don't remember where they found it. It was, like, they were doing, like, drywall work in a house and found, like, a McDonald's bag from, like, the 70s. And opened it up and unwrapped this like burger, and it literally looked like it had just been. They just bought it. I'm like that's yeah. that can't be. I mean, it went viral. This story. It was just, it's, it can't be good. It's shocking. But um, we're coming up on two hours, which is not a bad thing. I love it. But unfortunately, this thing will stop recording at two hours. <laughs> but I want to kind of talk about one thing because I I think of this as like I know at some point you return home. Like with a bunch of like, like not necessarily you, you, you return home with like mental, I don't want to call it baggage, but like you, you have things you bring back home. And I always wonder, it's like, do you come back 
like happier, like with a sense, like a profound sense, I guess, of like appreciation for what you have, or is, is it the opposite where you, it's so impactful, like these kind of trips that you can't be happy where you're at. I always wonder, like, is there a struggle there? Is it, or maybe I'm thinking into it too much. (laughs) I know exactly what you mean. I got a buddy that he's went with me the last two years to Africa and he just hunts. So he'll do, we'll do a, a four or five days of hunting. And then he'll fly or he'll go where, and then we'll go fishing. But it run his hunting on his ranch for him because he just didn't feel like his ranch lived up to like, there's so many more animals there. There's so much more variety. There's just, it's, and it's all new. That's part of it. For me, it's the opposite. I, like, I don't ever want to leave, but when I get home again, that's when I start realizing like how different and how, appreciative you need to be of what you just did because it, it i know this is a great country and all that but if you're like like me and you want adventure and you want a different you want to be in the wild and you want to meet these people this isn't the best place to be. like like there's some wild places here but there's nothing like you, you know in south africa even in oh, south yeah. africa is not even that wild you get up into zambia zimbabwe botswana mozambique i mean good god you disappear there forever but for me as much as I don't like coming home, I don't mind being home because I'm like, first of all, well, I'm not a rich guy. I got to go to work. So the only way I'm going to get to go in my next adventure is to go do as much work as I can while I'm here. Two, it changes your perspective when it's fresh on your mind, just like the guy with the shoes or, or the, you know, the food we're talking about. That's fresh on your mind. And when I land and the first thing I do is hit the water burger and I'm like, I love it. I love sweet tea, but it's so different from where I just came from. And I, and I want to be able to appreciate what I have, but also what I can attain, what I can do. If I don't stay here and work and I don't make a plan, I don't have money and I start losing that desire to go other places, then I'm done. Like, just forget it. Like, why am I even going to work? What's the point? Right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't like coming home, but I want to be home because that's the only thing that gets me to where financially and mentally where I'm ready to go again. I yeah. need to get to the next spot. And I'll go sit in my deer stand. Well, it'll be a hog stand this weekend, but I put bait out. I'll go out there this weekend. I'll sit there Saturday evening I'll, and I'll I'll probably kill a pig and we'll skin it and we'll eat it. And I've done it a million times and, and I love it and I don't ever want to stop doing it. It doesn't for me take anything away from what I'm doing local for me. Right. But like yeah. I said, I got a buddy. He's like, I don't even want to go hunt whitetail no more. I'm like, yeah. well, but he, he uh, he's a very end results guy. Like he's very, like, I just want to kill the kudu. I just want to catch the biggest fish. He misses a lot of things between it. And that, that's not the way I am. I want to, I want to go on stocks. I want to go on different, you know, I'm not looking for that end result. To me, there's not an end result. Like there's not a, it's not like when, when, when you kill the, or catch whatever it is, it's over. Yeah. You can do this again. You know, you can go to another spot. You're acting like it's it's the end of like, well, I already did that. Not yes. ever going you don't want to have a again. checklist mentality with this Dude, stuff. I'm not a checklist guy and a tape measure guy. I couldn't tell you what half the fish I caught mm-hmm. were weighed or how long they were. And I can't tell you how big any animal. In fact, the last pH I hunted with two weeks ago, I told him, put your tape measure up. I don't want to see it this week. I'm not, I, you know, I was serious, but I'm not saying I wasn't rude about it. I'm like, hey, man, throw your tape measure away. And he looks yeah, at me yeah. like, why are you here? Throw your tape measure out. I killed that uh, that world record blessed buck, which would be the air gun world record. He said, hey, I'm sorry, but I have to pull the tape measure out because that's the biggest one. I'm like, all right, that's fine. But he even knew, like this whole week, we're not hunting inches. We're not here for this has to be bigger than my buddies. We're here for the hunt, not the end result. And that's just how I do everything. Right. No, that's, that's such a good perspective to have. and. Uh, I don't know. I think there needs to be more of that out there. And I know you mentioned you don't do like a lot of the social media stuff. It's probably a good thing. It's a good way to poison your mind. It's like, it's hard to know how much of that to like, like, like consume. It's because it's a good tool to like get a, draw a little bit of inspiration from like, it's, it's how I met you. You know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. But it's like, you see a lot of people who, who, I don't know, man, it's like they fall into it. Like it becomes this weird, but to me, trap. You have to. Too many people look at everything as a competition. It's yeah. not. We're on the same team, in my mind. 
If you need information from me, call me. Look, just yeah. because I tell you this is the spot to go, this is the guy to go to, and this is the river, doesn't mean that your result's going to be the same as mine. I'm going to point you in, in a direction that's going to be, you know, make you successful as you can be with your ability. There's guys that go, dude, I'm never going to try to catch a Mekong catfish. That's not fun. The fight's, you know, an hour. Like, okay, fine. Then go catch something else. But if a guy wants to catch a Mekong catfish, Call me. I'll tell you who to call. I'll tell you where to go. And I'll tell you what to do. Like yeah. It's not a competition. We're on the same team here. I'm here to help you. Yeah. You should help me. If I call you and say, hey, I want to catch a bowfin in Florida. I'm calling you. And I feel like you're going to go, here's the spot. Mm-hmm. Same way if you want to come kill a pig. It's not me saying I'm better than you. It's me saying I have information. If y'all would like it, contact me. Right. That, that's the way I see it. it. It is such a great tool for doing that. And it's like somewhere I think I feel like that's what it started as when it first kind of happened. It was like and I've said this in other episodes, it's like it, it used to be called social networking sites. Then it turned into the, the term became social media sites. So it's like it changed, but it, it's a great tool for that kind of thing. Like I like to find people who I might be able to network with. And I have some of the best trips I've been on in the last couple of years like respond from a relationship that I tied on like Instagram. Like I just came back from doing a white sturgeon thing earlier this year from some guy who I met through another guy on Instagram. But it's saying, you know, you just, you got to like dig through the disingenuous stuff. I think you can get, you're right. You can get a feel for kind of people that if you're doing a, like a DIY kind of deal, you need information, but you also don't need bad information. So you can sort through it where like with a guy, the guy don't have a choice who he got as a client. The guy calls and, hey, you know, I'm booking this day. Okay, and he shows up. Like, this is, this is why I couldn't be a guy at all because I, I just can't deal with it. But yeah. with social media, you don't even know I'm researching you, right? You're, you, I've heard you say, like, I'm, I try not to be a stalker, but I'm stalking this guy. Well, that's that's not that, – that's that's you doing it. You're benefiting yourself, and you're not harming anybody. Go ahead. That's why it's on there. It's 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 on social media and it's public for a reason. If they didn't want you yeah. to know it, then they wouldn't put it on there. I don't know, man. It's like it, I look at a photo and it's like you want to know that there's a human being on the other side of that. So it's a lot of times I'll I'll look into it. You know, I want to know, you know, <clears throat> that's really why I've enjoyed this whole podcast thing. I had, you know, it's it's funny. It's like I am probably the most antisocial. I want to say antisocial. Like went like left to my own devices. If I'm thrown into a crowd of people, I'm very reclusive. I, but I'm also like, at the, while I typically don't talk to a lot of people, I'm like very in tune with like watching, listening, learning, observing. Uh, but you can pick it's out like, the BSers, you know? Yeah. But this has all been a pretty fun way. Like, there, there's a lot of guys that I've had on so far or people that I was following for years before. I'm like, finally, we're like, learning each other as human beings not just you know at right. billy bob one two three and on i think when when you realize i'm not saying you personally i'm just saying people that what they've done is obtainable to you people mm-hmm. a lot of times look and they're like man i wish i could well, why can't you yeah why can't you go catch a nine foot sturgeon why why not like it's not it, these are people doing this this is not some special group of you know, elite, they're, they're dudes that go to work just like yes. I do, just like you do. This is obtainable. And when you meet a lot of these people, you realize they're just a country boy like me, but they just have a different thing to chase. I yep. got hog, my, my, you know, buddy, wherever Montana, that, that's pheasants. Hey, come down, shoot a pig. I'll go shoot a pheasant. Like they're just people too, just like us, but everyone looks at it. as like this competition. Like th- this is why I'm hesitant to post a lot of things. Not because I care about what other people think, just because I don't want to look like bragger guy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a competition to me, but I feel like people take it as a competition. So if I put some, it's like I'm trying to scoreboard you. That's not what I'm doing it for. If you took it that way, sorry, but I got information. If you want it, call me up. That's that's why I do. Yeah, I think people who are in that frame of mind may gauge it that way, but you know, there's enough people. I feel like the the more silent people on social media like the ones that aren't super loud and projecting everything can gauge that really well but anyway i want to talk about like you know you've done some really cool trips 
and you've got awesome perspectives on these things. And I know we're talking about like social media, this social media, that it's it. At the end of the day, it's a great tool to connect with people, ask questions. Again, a lot of these trips seem out of reach. It seems like something that, you know, it, it would cost you $10,000 to go do. Um, but people who would want to reach out to you, if they have questions about alligator gar, I see you gotten into the buffalo thing. Oh, the hunts that you do. If I was more of a hunter, I could have really turned this into that. It's 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 crazy. Um, and then obviously the trips, but like people who would maybe be curious beyond this podcast to ask you about this stuff. How like how would they find you? Like what is your Instagram? Instagram? Is- Chris M. Cook, I think. Everything pretty much Chris Cook, except the cafes and campfires. Uh, there is a cafes and campfire. I hadn't done that near as much as I need to lately, but there's still a lot of information on there if you don't even want to talk to me. And it's just, just a really good there. read. It's a great read. I love the blog. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. But uh, there's cafes and campfires Facebook page too, but then Chris Cook's my personal one. And in any of those, I'm, I'm pretty – I mean, I respond – to pretty much anybody and unless you just come at me really sideways we're gonna be all right but and i've had had those i mean look i call them disney animals like i told you you put a disney animal up (laughs) you're gonna get some hate that's fine i get it but i'm not i'm not i I don't get violent with those people i'm not gonna cuss and scream and yell at them like like i said if you if you haven't had the experience then don't tell me how to have my experience yep right and i'm not looking down on someone who hasn't been there until they want to give me their opinion on something they've never even seen. Now we're going to have a problem. But no, if anybody wants any information, I mean, I guides, numbers, whatever it is, or just to suggest, I don't care. Dude, I love talking about it. I'm, like I said, I put it out there for other people because a lot of people feel like there's it's just not obtainable. It is. I told you, I, dude, I grew up in a, in a trailer house with a flat tire. I work 40 hours a week, just like you and everybody else. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, it's, it's a mentality you need and it's a way you need to live. If you have a $750 a, a month truck payment and you work a 40 hour job, you're probably not going to Africa to, on a safari. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Like it's just those, that math doesn't add up. I drive a, a 2008. It's been paid for, well, cash money. I'm fine with that. You know, my cousin says, how, how did you afford Africa twice in one year? I said, how much is your truck payment? He said, 764. I said, times 12. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And I said, that's how much I spent on Africa this year. That's the difference. It was nine, 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 $9,600 is what he said I paid in, in truck payments this year. $9,600, I'm fishing in Africa twice. Mm. That's the difference. It's not that it's not obtainable. It's that people suck at being broke. And trying to impress their neighbor. I got good at being broke because I was born broke. But you don't. Yeah. who cares what the guy next door thinks about your truck? Go show him a picture of your tiger fish. That should impress him, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's, my mentality. Uh, That's just the way I think about it. Well, man. I don't have, I don't have new stuff. I don't have shiny stuff. I don't. I, for, the, for the, what I do, I really don't have that much equipment either. Because like I said, a lot of the equipment I buy, I leave. But I'm not a gun guy. I got three or four but I'm pretty good at using them. I'm, I have six carp rods that are de- dedicated carp rods, you know, full Euro setup. That's yep. fine, but I'll have it for the rest of my life. I got gator guard setups. I'm done. I bought that. It's over. Take care of your crap and you're fine. I don't, I'm not yep. saying abuse it, but I'm not saying baby it. Look, we go fishing for gator guard. It's going to get muddy. It's going to get nasty. You're going to have to hose them down when you get in, but they'll last for a long time. That yeah. Way. You know, I have, just, I, I have my same setup for alligator gar for the last, Ah oh, man, twelve years. I use the same rods and reels every year or every time I go, and I use them for a lot of different things. You just take care of it a little bit, but man, yeah. it it, it kind of goes back to that whole thing about like what can you or can you not take to the grave with you, um, you know. And it's like, and, and I know we mentioned earlier that morbid thing about sitting back and reflecting on when well, time's running out. We, but we can't take these memories to the grave with us either. But it makes living until we die a lot easier. Yeah. Yep, you know, like I can't take my rod and reel, but I also can't tell the story I just told you when I'm in the grave. But in yep. the meantime, fishing, hunting, and having those experiences makes getting to the grave a lot smoother ride. Yep, thousand percent. Well, man, I hope I know you're not too big on the social media thing. I for my own like uh, uh, selfish, <laughs> you know, selfishness. I hope you keep sharing that stuff. We need more authenticity out there, more like genuine, genuinely passionate outdoorsmen anglers hunters everything um you know putting that putting that 
more positive stuff out there uh, and letting it shine through some of the stuff that's muddied the waters of that whole scene. But uh, Chris, man, I, I really appreciate your time. This is probably been oh, one of the great dude. Yeah, hey, when is... you get ready to, to start uh, doing some hunting, I got a ranch. For sure. It's funny away. you mentioned the pig one. The pig Pigs one. There the, right now. the pig one's been a man. That's been one that I've always wanted to do. I don't know why. I don't know why that one gets to me, but it's like, anyway, um, I try to make a trip to Texas every other year or so. So definitely, definitely yeah, you'll yeah. be like, you'll be a guy that I reach out to about that. Cause that would be, that'd be awesome. But I, anyway, I, at man. this point, I like taking people better than, than I do. I'll go sit and watch them a lot, but yeah. I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather you be there shooting one and having your experience. Cause I know what those experiences are like, you know, for a new guy, I know what it's like. And I'm like, that shit is that's a, you'll have that the rest of your life. Your first everything, right? Like, yeah, it's awesome. But cool. yeah, hit me cool. up when you get down here for sure. And I appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, dude. I'm glad that somebody rec recommended you to me. Um, it's been a been an awesome, probably one of my most enjoyed conversations. I say this with a lot of the guys, but I'm dead serious. Like, I like the stuff that goes more than just like. How do you catch this fish? What kind of line are you using? What kind of hooks? Like it's, you know, man. For me, it's like I I want to know more. I gotta I gotta know more. Some people just don't want to have that con conversation, or some people just can't have that conversation. But man, you're right. I don't know, man. I feel like we speak the same language in a lot of ways. Maybe with oh, a different yeah, <laughs> different accent, different dialect. But but I think I think our minds are geared a little bit the same, uh, even though our backgrounds are different and things like that. But anyway, Chris, we'll, uh, we'll end it on that, man. I, I appreciate you coming on here and, uh, we'll be, we'll be talking for sure. We'll do it again, man. Thank you. All right, dude. Take it easy. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the boundless pursuit podcast. If you enjoyed this show, your feedback, comments, and reviews are very important to me. Also, this podcast is just one element to a much bigger content outlet. I urge you to head over to www.haverodswilltravel.com where you'll find audio, visual, and written editorial content. That is three dimensions of awesome fishing content brought to you by a very dynamic team of anglers. I hope that you'll tune in next week as we continue to build this program and have interesting and skilled anglers each Thursday. Thank you for listening.